Okay, we are now in public session. The purpose of this morning's meeting is to meet with officials from the Department of Health and representatives of the HSE in order to discuss issues arising from the cervical check programme. On behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome Mr Jim Breslin, Secretary General, Mr Greg Dempsey, Deputy Secretary, Ms Tracy Conroy, Assistant Secretary, Ms Celeste O'Callaghan, Principal Officer of the Department, and from the HSE, Ms Anne O'Connor, Interim Director General, Mr Damien McCallion, National Director at National Screening Services, Dr Peter McKenna, Clinical Director, National Women's and Infants Health Programme, and Dr Lorraine Doherty, Clinical Director, Cervical Check. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or, or it identifiable. I also wish to advise you that any opening statements you have made to the committee may be published on the committee website after this meeting. Meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the Houses or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Now, can I now ask Mr Jim Breslin to uh, make your opening statement? And you're all very welcome here this morning. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to thank the Committee for the opportunity to meet this morning. I'm joined by my colleagues Mr Greg Dempsey, Deputy Secretary, Governance and Performance Unit, Ms Tracy Conroy, Assistant Secretary, Acute Hospitals Policy, and Ms Celeste O'Callaghan, Principal Officer, Acute Hospitals Policy. The issues relating to non-disclosure of the results of the retrospective cervical check audit emerged in late April 2018. Since that time, there has been considerable focus within the Department and the HSC on the management and oversight of related operational challenges and strategic priorities, and on the implementation of key government decisions in relation to cervical check. Resulting from the Government's desire to assist women and families affected by the lack of disclosure, Government decided in May to provide a comprehensive package of health and social care supports for the cohort of 221 women and families for whom the audit carried out by Cervical Check found discordance with the original reading of their slide or slides. The HSE now has an established and stable process in place to ensure that these supports are being provided through designated liaison officers. In making its decision, Government also decided that this comprehensive package of supports would be provided to any other woman for whom the independent clinical expert review being carried out by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists identified discordance with her original smear test reading. In its invitation, the committee has referenced women not included in the 221, and I trust this clarifies the position in that regard. The HSE has recently completed a validation report on the status of the 221 group, which has been shared with the women and families within the group. It is intended that this report will assist in ensuring appropriate supports are provided to these women and families. Also in May, Government decided to establish a scoping inquiry led by Dr Gabriel Scally. Dr Scally's report set out the impact of non-disclosure on the women and families affected by it, as well as providing useful clarity on the limitations of screening and audit. He set out 50 recommendations aimed at addressing the shortcomings which he identified across a range of areas in screening. In December, following Government approval, an implementation plan for all of the recommendations of the scoping inquiry was published on the website of the Department of Health. Some of the key elements include continuation of the current dedicated team within Cervical Check to ensure access to medical records and slides, the inclusion of patient advocates on the HSE board, establishment of a national screening committee, actions to address recommendations on laboratory services and on procurement, the need for mandatory disclosure which is addressed within the forthcoming Patient Safety Bill. Establishment of an independent Patient Safety Council, which will, as its first action, undertake a review of open disclosure policies. A number of actions to be led by the National Cancer Registry addressing data sharing, data definitions and collection of patient level details, as between it and the National Screening Service, as well as governance. Establishment of an expert group within the HSC to review the clinical audit processes across all cancer screening programmes and patient advocates will be included in this process. I referred earlier to the independent clinical expert review which is being led by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists following a government decision of the 8th of May 2018. 
Expertise for this review is being sourced through the British Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology. The review includes women who are part of the cervical check audit and women who are not. Specifically, the scope of the review includes cases of invasive cervical cancer in Ireland since cervical check was established, or around 3,000 cases up to May 2018. This 3,000 cases includes the 1,482 cases which were notified to cervical check since 2008. These women's screening histories were audited by cervical checks once they had been notified of their cancer diagnosis. And through that process, the 221 were identified for whom there was discordance with their original results. In addition to the cases notified to cervical check, a further approximately 1,600 cases <coughs> were notified to and the were not notified to and therefore not audited by cervical check. Some of these women had been screened prior to diagnosis. <coughs> the independent clinical expert review encompasses those women within the overall group of 3,000 who were screened by the programme prior to diagnosis are approximately 1,700 <coughs> women who are currently contactable and comprehended by the review following a detailed validation process. Where the expert panel's opinion of cytology results differs to the original results provided by cervical check, the panel will endeavour to determine wherever possible any failures to prevent cancer or to intervene at an earlier stage and will prepare individual reports for those affected, setting out the facts and their expert and independent assessment of those facts. The review will also produce an aggregated report which will be provided to the Minister and which is to include recommendations where appropriate with the aim of improving care for women. A consent process has been undertaken over the past number of months following an extensive process of validation of data. The HSE has advised that more than 1,070 women have now consented to take part in the review. This is approximately 63%, which is a welcome level of uptake and will facilitate the production of a robust aggregated report. The expert review panel has been provided with colposcopy and other data from cervical check in respect of women who have consented to participate and the transfer of slides to the review laboratory has begun. The Royal College has indicated a time frame of at least six months to complete the review. The Government agreed on the 18th of December to establish an independent statutory tribunal chaired by Ms Justice Mary Irvine. Primary legislation will be required to establish the tribunal. Judge Meenan provided the Government with detailed recommendations on the establishment of the tribunal and the Department has been working intensively on the drafting of a general scheme. The required legislation is legally novel in providing for the determination of liability outside of a traditional court setting. It is expected that the general scheme will be submitted to Government very shortly for approval to draft the Bill. This Bill is a Government priority and is therefore included in the Spring Legislative Programme. The Department is also working on the operational elements of the Tribunal's establishment, including securing premises. Separately, the Minister also confirmed in December that, in advance of the establishment of the Tribunal, he would examine the early establishment of a non-statutory scheme to provide ex gratia payments for women who were affected by the non-disclosure results of the retrospective audit. The development of this draft scheme is in progress in the Department in advance of going to Government. The Department is aware that these are issues to which the utmost priority attaches and is working speedily to ensure their completion. In its final report, Dr Scali emphasised that continuation of cervical screening was of crucial importance. His report affirmed that the lifetime risk of a woman in Ireland getting cervical cancer was 1 in 135 in 2015, compared to 1 in 96 in 2007, representing a substantial improvement since the programme commenced. The HC undertook detailed negotiations in the latter half of 2018 to extend the contracts of the existing laboratory service providers in order to ensure continuation of screening. Dr Scali also stated in his report that improved screening uptake, the new HPV testing regime and the extension of the HPV vaccine to boys together create a realistic prospect of the virtual elimination of cervical cancer in Ireland in the coming decades. These are a key focus for the Department and the HSE in 2019. In parallel and in interlinked with these priorities, the management of current capacity issues remains a priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Breslin. Uh, I now invite Ms Anne O'Connor of the HSE to make your opening statement. Good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. 
Thank you for the invitation to attend the committee meeting. I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. Damien McCallion, National Director of Screening Services, Dr. Peter McKenna, Clinical Director, Women's and Infants Programme, and Dr. Lorraine Doherty, Clinical Director from Cervical Check. Our focus continues to be on supporting women and their families who were impacted by the cervical check crisis. We have continued to provide a wide range of supports in line with those agreed with the Department of Health. This has included the provision of 602 medical cards and the upgrading of eligibility for another 91 medical card holders, provision of access to a broad range of HSE and HSE funded supports and the reimbursement of 1.2 million in expenses and costs to those affected. In addition, we recently completed a detailed piece of work that updated the information on the 221 patient group. This was done in conjunction with the 221 plus group, patient representatives and will help inform the provision of future supports for the group. We also continue to support women and their families in the provision of access to their records and ensuring women get their slides from laboratories where required for legal review. A new client services unit was established in our national screening service to support this process. 109 out of 118 slide requests have been dealt with in on average 25 days and there are only nine requests still being processed. We are continuing to support the independent international expert panel review being undertaken by the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology, ORCOG, which was established by the Minister for women who were diagnosed with cervical cancer. The HSE supports the consent process which has seen 1,072 women or their next of kin consent to participation out of an eligible group of 1,702. This included establishing a national help desk, developing an elig eligibility data set with the National Cancer Registry and implementation of a client management system to support the ORCOG. In recent weeks, the laboratories have commenced the transfer of slides. All slides have been transferred by the Coombe Women and Infants University Hospital. Quest Diagnostics and Sonic Healthcare have also commenced the transfer process, with the imaging of slides for transfer and a transfer schedule now being agreed this week with those laboratories. We remain concerned at the length of time being taken for reporting of cervical smears, which is on average of 93 days, although it can take up to 27 weeks for the report to be provided. There is currently a backlog of circa 78,000 slides. In 2018, around 370,000 women presented to the programme, an increase of 280,000 in 2017. This increase of circa 90,000 was as a result of the uptake of the out-of-cycle smear test and more women presenting to the programme which would in normal circumstances be a positive step. We have worked with existing private providers, other private providers and public service providers in other countries to try and grow our laboratory capacity. Some of our existing providers have managed to reduce the wait times and we continue to work with others to try and find additional capacity. While we continue to pursue active leads, this has proved very challenging due to the global shortage in cytology. This has been caused as a result of the reduced cytology requirement as countries implement HPV primary screening, which sees a reduction of around 80% for cytology requirements. We are actively trying to identify possible solutions that will help to reduce the wait times, which we know are causing a lot of anxiety for women. As part of the laboratory's quality assurance process, we also were made aware of an issue with regard to HPV tests expiration at Quest Diagnostics. While the clinical risk was deemed very low, we have contacted all those affected and a number of women are being retested. These tests will be expedited by Quest Diagnostics to ensure a timely response for those women requiring a retest. A key risk to enable cervical screening to continue in Ireland was the extension of the laboratory contracts. The HSE has a signed, con signed agreement with one of the private providers and are working through the detail on a contract with the second provider, with whom we have a heads of agreement. We also made a strategic decision to develop a national cervical screening laboratory in conjunction with the Coombe Women and Infants University Hospital. This included an initial capital allocation of five million to progress the development of the laboratory. A project team and steering group has been put in place to oversee all aspects of this project. This will take some time to develop, but will provide a better balance between public and private provision of laboratory services to the cervical screening program. We are progressing plans to introduce HPV primary screening. A project team is in place and is progressing the various work streams. We have completed a review of international HPV primary screening implementations, ICT testing is underway, development of education training materials has commenced and our procurement team have started the tender process for laboratory services with a pre-tender market engagement session held before Christmas. We remain committed to implement HPV primary screening as soon as possible. The HSE has contributed significantly to the development of an implementation plan in collaboration with other state agencies in response to the SCALI review recommendations. 
We have appointed a senior manager to oversee the implementation and established a HSE implementation oversight group, jointly chaired by our Chief Clinical Officer and Deputy Director General for Operations. We have developed a set of 94 actions arising from recommendations that are the responsibility of the HSE to implement. Examples of progress to date include key appointments and governance changes. An organisational review of risk management structures has also been commissioned by the HSE, in addition to the establishment of an expert group within the National Screening Service to review clinical audit processes across all screening programmes. An interim revision of the HSE open disclosure policy has commenced and will be communicated and implemented throughout the system, pending a more detailed review during 2019. The HSE has also reviewed and updated its financial records management policy. All six recommendations from Dr Scaddy's interim report have now been fully implemented. The HSE has maintained open communication with patient representatives in relation to the implementation plan and will continue to work collaboratively with them throughout 2019. Finally, we have continued to strengthen the governance and management of our screening services. We have established an interim management team with the reassignment of senior people to key positions while we fill key positions on a permanent basis. We have recently appointed a Director of Public Health, Cervical Check Clinical Director and Cervical Check Laboratory Quality Assurance Lead. In addition, a risk committee for our screening services, which is independently chaired, has been put in place since quarter three 2018. An interim quality and risk manager was also appointed in quarter three, and implementation of Dr Scaddy's recommendations on strengthening our quality assurance process has commenced. I can assure members that the HSE is absolutely focused on establishing the cervical screening programme, and hence enabling us to progress the introduction, or sorry, stabilising the cervical screening programme, and hence enabling us to progress the introduction of a new enhanced HPV primary screening testing methodology. All possible resources are being directed at this challenge. This concludes my opening statement, and together with my colleagues, we'll endeavour to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, I have one or two questions, and then we'll, we'll take committee members in order, if that's agreed. Um, so, my first question is one around the offer that was made on the 28th of April uh, by the Minister for free repeat smear tests. Now, we, we understand the climate at the time. Um, but I'm more interested in the advice that would have been received by the Minister as to how wise or otherwise uh, it was to, uh, to make that, uh, that offer. So if perhaps you could outline, obviously you guys are all the experts in this area, um, who was advising the Minister before that offer was made, what discussions, consultations were held, specifically about the availability of resources to deal with it, because clearly we have a backlog now which um, can be traced back in some, in some way, shape or part to that announcement. So can you advise uh, what advice the Minister would have been given, who he sought that from, what information would have been given to him and what provisions were put in place in resource terms in advance of the announcement uh, that was made? Thanks. So, um the source of the advice to the Minister would have been officials in the Department of Health. Uh, that would have included the Chief Medical Officer. And uh, you, you've mentioned this, uh, Chair, uh, very much the context of this was the anxiety, uh, both uh, across uh, interested parties, but also women concerned ringing the helpline and looking for clarity around this. Um, there was a great deal of anxiety. Uh, there was undoubtedly a situation where women were going to present at their GP. Certainly those women who could afford to do so were going to present at their GP, and perhaps women who couldn't afford to do so wouldn't have been able to. So the Minister made the decision in uh, what had to be a rapid uh, situation. Uh, negotiations with the IMO on a, fee, on a fee were put in place, and uh, the option was put there for women to consult with their GP and if following that consultation the woman and her family doctor uh, decided to have a retest that that would be paid for. Um, so that was the context and, and officials were involved in that decision and provided the Minister with the advice I, I've outlined. Uh, on the issue of resources, um, I think it is fair to say that in all of our discussions with the HSE during 2018, because of the cervical check controversy, we rapidly put any resources in place that were required 
uh, so the financial provision around the measures that had to be put in place to respond to this controversy uh, were, were rapidly deployed and the HSC was in uh, constant contact with us on costs and, and all of those costs were met over the course of 2018. I think the issue though that arises in this situation is not one of financial resources but the ability to leverage additional capacity and um, the HSC can speak to all of the work that they've done and they've done a huge amount of work to try and up the amount of capacity within the screening program um, and they continue to do so and there are constraints in relation to that. Um, a couple of other things I'd say, Chair, is obviously in the situation of making that the decision, uh, that's a difficult one to quantify what the exact uptake of a retest will be and we now know the level of that uptake. Um, the, um, the interest and anxiety around cervical check continued for a very protracted period and undoubtedly fed into that and also worth noting is um, the finalisation of the SCALI report allowed for a clarity around the issue um, but that report uh, took longer than was originally envisaged so we had a period there while uh, Dr SCALI was looking at the labs and was doing his work where the retest continued um, and as the Minister said in the House last week once the SCALI report was done, uh, he took further advice and uh, that advice led him to write to the HSE to say uh, he believes it an appropriate time to bring the retest to an end and the HSE advised that they would do so that, but that because uh, tests were scheduled into December for women that the end of December would be the cut-off point and uh, that, that has now taken place. Okay, but according to media reports at the weekend, uh, senior people in the HSE we're advising against this. Is that accurate? Uh, Would I anyone don't in the HSE advise? I mean, there's, well, there's people from the HSE here, yeah, Mr. I, Besson, who might so, be able to answer so that. So I don't think in the, in the timeline that the Minister made, he received advice against this. Um, subsequently, uh, subsequently, over a, a longer period, people have a, a view on it and different views have emerged. Some of the people who had a view at the time it was made subsequently changed their view of it. Um, but uh, at the time, the Minister made the decision based on the advice available to him, and he didn't have uh, advice uh, to the contrary. So he advised in advance that this was not a good idea, or that that's the my understanding that the minister didn't have contrary advice in advance of that decision. None at all. None at all. And perhaps the members of the HSE might want to yeah, give any advice on this from the HSE. Okay, and that is contradicted by what was in the media at the weekend, but uh, nonetheless, I'm sure we'll get to the bottom of it at some point. Um, with regard to the, the practical advice in terms of, like, okay, so I, I fully accept you couldn't have known precisely exactly what the number was, but you would have known that there was going to be an increase. Um, is it the case that any provisions were made? Because it, well, I tell you what it looks like, it doesn't look, when you look in at this, as if research was done or information sought or any provisions put in place for the necessary increase in resources. Now, I, I fully respect the fact that you couldn't have known exactly what the number was, but you definitely knew there was going to be an increase. I mean, even if you only went off what, the, what they call that, that Jade Goody effect, that you know, raising the profile is going to do two things. One, it's going to ensure that women who had concerns are going to come back. You would have heard that from the helpline. But also that, uh, that women who haven't uh, previously presented uh, for a smear test were also going to, to uh, take up that offer. So in advance of that, and, and this is where I think a, a lot of people are very, are very angry about it, because in advance of it, it doesn't seem that, the, uh, that work was done to ensure there was going to be additional provision. And that then has led to this backlog. So I suppose the, I mean, you're saying the minister received advice from the, uh, the chief medical officer, etc. But was anybody working on ensuring that there was additional capacity? So I think you have to, you have to and, and the HSE can speak to this, you have to look at the programme itself and how it's organised and its ability to increase capacity. So the contracts are not budget limited. We don't have a situation with the HSE where we say this number of screens and then stop. Uh, the laboratory screen based on the tests that are taken. But the reality, and this is relevant to where we are now, the reality is the capacity of those laboratories to expand the numbers of screens is limited based on their ability to get the human resources to do so. So the HSE would have been liaising, as they do as part of the normal programme with the laboratories, to try and scale that up. 
but significant issues have been encountered in doing that in a situation where globally there are, are very significant no, no, constraints. No, no, it's a global situation aside. I'm asking a question about what was done before the offer was made on the 28th of April. So there was a clarity that this would lead to more screening having to be performed. There wasn't a, a specific number that was predictable in relation to that, but there was a clarity that that would have a knock-on implication for the number of screens to be done. Uh, sorry, no, Mr. Breslin, that, that's not making any sense to me. What clarity was there? I'm so, just, in, in making the decision. Just, just, it's, a, it's a fairly plain question. I, on the 28th of April, the Minister made an offer. He said anyone that, 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 any woman that wants it can have a, a free repeat test or a free test. So, before that was done, did anyone do anything to ensure that there was additional capacity, however, that was purchased in advance of that offer being made? Or was the offer made? And then, at that stage, uh, the, the, the backlog started to build up. So, I'm talking about the period in before the 28th of April. Yeah, so, like, having lived through this, uh, we're now looking back on it in a way that wasn't how the real-time chronology of events took place. We were all living through this. We're all sitting here now, having been part of a discussion around the need for the programme to respond to the public anxiety that was out there, and the Minister being pressed to make a call on this. People calling from it, including members of the House calling from it to do that, phone calls into the helpline to do that, and officials working with them to try and make the best decision possible in that situation. That was made in a, in a matter of hours and days, not in a matter of weeks. So if you're saying to me, was a full capacity analysis performed? Was a full review of all of the capacity and the global potential to increase that? No, it wasn't. There was a very worthwhile and very honourable desire to try and respond to the anxiety that ha was out there. And some of it was based on misinformation. Some of the anxiety had actually been created by information that wasn't accurate. It was only when we got to the Scali report that we brought a clarity and Dr Scali brought a clarity to the underlying issues. I lived through this and I didn't have the ability to go off and do a capacity study for weeks on end to try and come up with what the right number of retests was going to be. That wasn't the problem that we were faced with. We were faced with a demand to make a decision because women were going to present with their GP on Monday and Tuesday of the following week and the government had to have a policy in relation to whether that was going to be financed or not. And that was how the decision was made. That's, I think that's answered my question anyway. Um, as we're sitting here today, do you know where all of the smear tests are going? Because there was an issue raised about that, about the re-outsourcing of the outsourcing and the re-outsourcing of that. Would you, do you know? Yeah, so in, in relation to the historical context with the labs, Dr Scally is looking at those that were identified. In terms of the current laboratories, we've got assurances from the laboratories in terms of the labs that we're working with today and where we've introduced additional laboratories. That's been through a formal approval and QA process. So we're confident in terms of what's there at the moment, in terms of knowing where the labs are, the slides and are going to And that assurance was given in writing? That assurance was given, yes, in, in both in verbal and... And um, Yeah, I can, I can certainly seek that documentation, yeah, in terms okay. of what's there. I, I, the I don't think there's anything in it that we couldn't have, but if you, yeah. if you could, if you yeah. could share that, which, that's good. Thank you. Um, okay, so I just have two more questions, and then we move on. The in your statement, Miss um, O'Connor, you say that you have developed a set of 94 actions arising from the recommendations of uh, the, the Scully report, and you list the examples of progress. So, can you give us some examples of where progress is not being made? and perhaps outline what the, what the issues are with that. Um, so just at, at a high level, and Damien can speak to the detail of it, so we have 94 actions. So of those, we have uh, 29 of those completed, and we have 53 in progress. Um, we are only overdue in terms of one uh, being finished, so they are all the actions that are set out and that have formed part of the overall and overarching implementation plan with colleagues in the department and others. Um, the, 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 I suppose the wins that we've had have been around the governance, the appointments, um, and they have been critical to the continuity of the programme. In terms of what we haven't achieved, I'll ask Damien to speak to that so far. Sorry, but this you say that there's 20, 50, 54 of the actions are in train, 29 53. are 53, mm -hmm. and 29 are completed. Mm -hmm. So does that leave 22 not done? Sorry. No, there's nine of them that are not due to start yet. Okay. Uh, there's two that are overdue to start. There's one that's overdue to finish. That's 13. So what, what's, where are we missing the numbers there? So just quickly recap, Deputy, maybe just on the numbers. There's 53 that are effectively in progress, one okay. overdue to finish, nine 
in terms of overdue and two and 29. This should be the total, 94. And that's nice yeah, sorry, yeah. Just, oh uh, just, just in terms of progress, in fairness, that they're um, largely so far, and Dr Scally has just done an initial review of the implementation plan and will be producing a report on it, um, we're really only in the first quarter of this, or quarter four was the first quarter where we had actions that were been undertaken in it. So largely there's nothing really at the moment that's given us concern in terms of what's there, and, and we've obviously had those discussions with Dr Scally. This quarter, quarter one of this year, is really a key quarter where a lot of the actions are due to commence and the bulk of the actions are intended to be done in 2019. Okay, thank you. And my final question is uh, in relation to your own statement. Ms O'Connor says you continue to support women and their families in the provision of access to their records and ensuring women get their slides from the labs where required for legal review. How many of those are outstanding? Nine. There's nine outstanding altogether. And August, so we had a significant increase, I think around the 14th of January, was it? We had a very significant number of requests, so there's nine of those that are still outstanding. Okay, and do you have a timeline for those? Yeah, so, so the nine that are left is one from December, and the balance then are either the 14th or 31st of January. So we have a process. We review deputy with the labs each week. Uh, there's about five or six of those, I think, with Quest, two with Sonic, and one with the Coom. So we go through those every week to get them accelerated and keep them moving. It's largely between the laboratory um, and the legal um, person on behalf of the, the woman or their family. Okay, but all so of the women concerned would have information now as to that. They, they all know that they're... Yeah, through, through their solicitors. Yeah. We would link through their solicitors in terms of where that's at. That's the mechanism. If the woman herself seeks it, and we've, we've had women request it, we'll contact contact them directly where they want that as well. So when we recently met the patient group, some women had inquiries in terms of their slides and we arranged to give them a personal okay, call as well. Okay, but the nine that's outstanding are in train? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, we're confident okay. they'll be turned around. Yeah. Uh, Deputy Donnelly. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you all very much for your time today and for the, um, for the opening statements. Can I ask first on the HPV test? Obviously, this was talked about with a lot of interest last year. It represents a higher level of detection and therefore patient safety. The Minister uh, was looking to have it implemented last September. Uh, when that deadline was missed, I believe the Minister was suggesting January to have it live. Uh, it's now February, and I know, Ms O'Connor, you've talked about progress, but the, the language you've used is um, as soon as possible. Can I ask, when do you now expect the HPV test to be live and available to women in Ireland? I can't put a date on that. Uh, our priority at the moment is to address the capacity challenges that we have um, and to set a date, which I could pick a date, but actually we have to, I suppose, evidence that in terms of the work that's underway. Damien can give detail on the very extensive work that's going on uh, around HPV, but we are caught in terms of addressing the current cytology challenges as well as trying to progress HPV. So we have to sort out our current situation first, address capacity, address the backlog and move to the new model. Um, if Damien wants to add to that. Do you have a, a, do you have a project plan in we, place for when you're, yeah. you, do, do you have at least a target date for when you're hoping to have it live? So, so there is a, pro a project schedule, Deputy. I, I think the, the, the Anne has just mentioned there's a couple of challenges in that. So one is we must eliminate the backlog. You must have a stable operating environment to bring in a new test. The second uh, piece then is we will need to tender. We've started the tender process for a partner to work with us to deliver that. And we did a pre what's called a pre-tender market engagement before Christmas. Uh, our, suppose our, our environment here is somewhat challenging in terms of securing a partner to work with us and the real risk is we've selected a procurement method that will allow us to negotiate which will give us more flexibility in terms of trying to ensure we secure a partner. We don't want to go to the market, issue a tender and discover we don't have a partner at the end and set the process back even further. The next stage in that process now is where we place an ad in the next two weeks. Uh, for that partner and that will allow us to get into what's called the competitive dialogue process with those. One of the reasons that we're reluctant to set a date until we see what that partner says they can do and provide in a time frame, we can't set an absolute date. Can I, so, can I ask just, just on the McCallion, uh, Mr McCallion, sure um, do, do you at least have a project plan with it? We do. Are so, you working to, I, I appreciate you're not willing to say we can guarantee yeah. that it'll be live by this date, I, I, I accept that. Um, I just want to understand, do you, are you at least working to a target date? So we have a number of work streams on the project plan, the procurement site, the laboratory reconfiguration, the education and uh, communication, the training materials for health professionals. And um, So there's a range of work streams, eight work streams in total, and those are all been monitored weekly in terms of the team. And we have a dedicated team that are working on this to try and ensure that, you know, because obviously there's a lot of other pressures on, on the programme at the moment. In terms of the end date, really, there's quite a variation depending on what that private partner can supply. 
why if it's an existing partner they'll be able to switch on quicker, if it's a new partner that could take longer. So in terms of the absolute end date, all of the, our aim is to get all of the other steps completed as quickly as possible so that we minimise the critical path at the end in terms of getting to the end point then on the date. So as Anna said, our objective is to get there as quickly as possible until we get into that competitive dialogue. We won't really know what that lead time is, it could be three months, six months, nine months in terms of getting the partner over the line. One important point is, in tandem with that, we have made a decision to rebalance the public-private provision in the programme. So we are developing a national cervical screening laboratory, the COOM, that will still only have a limited increase. The COOM currently do about 9% before the end of this year, so that will take time to develop. So we're still very reliant on securing a partner uh, to help us to deliver HPV primary screening. So, so is, it, is it possible that the HPV test will not be live in 2019? I, I don't want to get into speculation, Deputy, to appreciate on it negatively or positively. We are focused on trying to get it in as quickly as possible. Uh, we have a detailed plan around it, but the critical path is ensuring we have a partner and understanding what they can deliver in the time frames. And I think I just, you know, speculation, in my view, would yeah. be unhelpful in that regard yeah. at the moment, accepting we all want to get there as quickly as we can. Okay, so there's, there's, there's no guarantee based on all these we, issues. We, we can't give an absolute at the moment, but yeah. clearly that's we're committed to get this in as quickly as possible, and we've tried to isolate resource and secure yeah. additional resource in with expertise that can help guide us. Thank so, you. for example, we have recently appointed a, a senior laboratory quality assurance, which was one of the areas Dr Scally identified where we hadn't got pathology expertise, and that man has experience coming from Wales where he led in their programme, was involved in the laboratory side for eight years. So that has been challenging to secure resource and expertise, no, but it, can, in doing can I, that it's helped us to move on. Can I ask on. then, that might be a question for, for you, Mr Breslin. Um, given all of this, given this complexity, and I, I absolutely accept your bona fides that you're trying to get this across the line as, as, as quickly as possible, um, the Minister did set expectations uh, early last year, or whenever it was, May, June last year, when he came into the chamber and he said he was going to aim to have the HPV test live in September 2018. Um, now, we're hearing that there's no guarantee, in spite of the best efforts, that it will be live in 2019. Did the Minister, in, in making that statement, that he, he aimed to have the HPV test in place by September of last year, did he seek advice and seek the sort of detail that we're now hearing about the, the difficulties in, in, in going live? Yeah, so I, I think uh, the world changed last year. We went into 2018 with a certain uh, view of the uh, screening programme and an objective, a policy objective to introduce HPV and a funding agreement on how we would do so and so on. The world changed during the course of April and May of uh, 2018 and what Mr McCallion has outlined has whole layers to it mm -hmm. in terms of the capacity of the programme, the personnel within the programme, the challenges and the multiple challenges they were facing on a, on a daily and weekly basis. The need to solidify that programme, to recruit into it, to bring new expertise and new personnel and new processes into place. All of that undoubtedly has had an implication for what would have been, this time last year, a steady state go forward approach to moving the programme in from one testing into another. Well, I, I accept all of that. Um, I, I guess the question I'm asking is, 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 is at a political level. So the, the, the sitting minister didn't make a commitment but, but raised the issue and said he was going to try and bring it forward to September. Now that set expectations for women all over the, over the country. I, I can't remember the date, but from, I would imagine that that, that, that announcement was made uh, around June of last year. Did he seek advice as to how feasible it was going to be to actually go live in September, given that we're hearing now, due to the complexities, that it, it might not even go live in, uh, this calendar year? Did the Minister seek advice before making So, the in truth, that was happening on an ongoing basis, and it was changing by the week. Um, the challenges the programme were facing were changing by the week. Um, the potential work involved on other factors other than HPV was changing by the week. Um, so there was an ongoing flow uh, as this, and it, it was a crisis, as this crisis evolved yeah. to uh, take a, 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 a stock check on where we were and what that meant, meant for HPV. And that has changed uh, as we've gone along. The backlog itself has changed. As I, 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 and I do appreciate that. I, I just, though, I'm looking for a specific answer on the Minister made a public announcement that was a very relevant announcement 
did he seek advice yeah, before so, making that announcement? And, and was that advice that it might actually be possible to go live in September? So I, I think the Minister's um, announcement and the Minister's view on what would be possible was overtaken by events. He had advice, he had uh, contact by officials with the HSE, but that was overtaken by events. And we had plans in place at the start of the year which didn't bear uh, uh, reality once the crisis took off. Right. So it's not that he didn't have advice, it's that the advice was overtaken by, by the reality. And at the time of the announcement, was the advice that it would be possible to go live in September? Well, I think it was his, his and our best hope that it would be possible, but in, in, in reality that hasn't emerged as, as achievable. Was he given advice either way as to whether it was feasible or not? Um, as I've said, I think it was based on the status quo on the on the position that then obtained. Yeah. So it's not that um, it's not that he didn't have advice; he had advice. And I, I'm just asking what that advice was. Was it was it was it, Minister? It's unlikely that you'll no. be able to go live so, in September. So the initial or... plan that would have been in place was informing his um, position on this and his and everybody's interests to try and do this as quickly as possible. What what wasn't as obvious at the time was that that plan was basically going to have to be torn up and rewritten because the challenges facing the programme were just going to overwhelm the ability to deliver on that plan. Okay. Th thank you. Can I go to the, um, to the backlog of 78,000? Obviously this is of uh, serious concern to women around Ireland who are uh, facing these, uh, these delays. Um, Dr Scally in his report said that for every thousand uh, tests, 15 women would be identified as having uh, precancerous abnormalities. Uh, a backlog of 78,000 would suggest that about 1,200 women within that cohort will be or have been identified as having uh, precancerous abnormalities, but either haven't been tested yet or have been tested and haven't got the results of, of those tests. Can I ask um, two questions? Could you talk about the delays? My understanding is they're, they're different around the country. There may be different priorities given uh, for different cohorts. Maybe there's higher risk women who are identified and, 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 it, and they're fast tracked. Um, so the first question is, could you just tell the committee about the level of delays? Uh, you know, where is it going well? Where is it not going well? Are there, are there delays over six months? And I think then critically the second question is, given that about 1,200 women within this backlog um, are likely to be identified as having precancerous abnormalities, is there any clinical risk associated with, say, a woman who's been identified as, as having an abnormality, be it low grade or high grade, and a potential wait of six months to, for, for her doctor and herself to get those results? Deputy Johnny, I'm going to try and get everyone to stick to as close to the yeah, 10 minutes, so that's your, that's your last Thanks. question. Yeah. Yeah. Can I thank you? First piece, Deputy, yeah. and ask my colleague Dr McKenna then maybe to speak on the, the clinical risk piece. Just in terms of the um, backlog, while there is some variation between laboratories uh, in terms of what's there, we have prioritised, for example, colposcopy, which we, would be the highest risk group across the labs, and clear instructions and guidance were given on that. Um, in addition to that, where one of the laboratories had pressure, we authorised what's called co-testing, where you would run the HPV test first, which allows you to triage and ensure then that you're taking out the smears that have the highest risk in terms of... So there are mitigation steps that we've taken in order to try and reduce that risk. Um, the other group that are there are women who are in short recalls. Deputy Kelly would have, would have asked this question before. We are working through trying to find a technology solution that might help to accelerate those. Uh, we don't have that at the moment, but we believe we, we will be able to do something around that. So we've tried to mitigate the at-risk groups uh, as best we can within the context of how the programme functions uh, in order to minimise that risk that you've described in terms of what's there. Um, and as I say, that the, uh, those steps are in place and, and functioning. And maybe I'll ask my colleague, Dr. McKenna, just to talk to the other point you made in relation to the uh, cancer precancerous or the, the development of cervical cancer. Well, we would all share the concern that uh, the uh, awaiting time in excess of a couple of months uh, is far from ideal. Um, I think it's probably true to say that the women who would have come for the, the reassuring test out of sequence would probably have a lower incidence of abnormality than those that would have waited five years for their, for their smear. However, having said that, 
Of course there will be women in that group, in the 80,000, who will have abnormal smears. Uh, as I've said here before, the natural history of cervical cancer is that there is a lead-in time of 10 to 15 years. And most of those women who have um, abnormal smears will be a long way from developing uh, cervical cancer. But there will inevitably be some women who are nearer uh, the stage of transitioning from pre-invasive to invasive. It's not really possible to give an estimate of the number. Um, but there, there is, it would be foolhardy to say there is no risk, uh, but in general the risk is low. Can I ask one just follow-up question just on that, Chair? It's just on, this, on, on, the, yeah. on the same topic. So, so, so thank you for that. The, the, the concern that people are coming to me with is, is exactly what you've just identified, is what if they're, if they're beyond you know, the very first testing where there is a lead time and actually a delay of six months shouldn't make that much difference because it might be 10 years and there's plenty of time for, for intervention and, 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 and treatment. Could you just talk to the potential clinical risk for women where the, the abnormalities have been detected beyond uh, where, where, where ideally they would be? They would be. Does, is there a risk? I guess the question I'm being asked is, is there a risk that treatment is potentially delayed um, for some women to the extent of this, say, whatever it is, four, five, six month wait. That's, that's the question they're, they're, they're putting to me. For the vast majority of women, the treatment will be the same in, in six months' time as it would have been if the smear had been reported now for the vast majority of pay, people. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, all right, so out of, um, as, as I'm chair, I'm going to try and keep everyone to the 10 minutes, and I fully respect the fact that Deputy Donnelly and I have not started really well, but we will get back on track with Deputy Kelly. Oh, <laughs> well, now I'm in the chair, Deputy Kelly, so we'll see. Oh, come on, um, you if we can try and be quick, because I'm, I'm conscious that we have Deputy <laughs> Kelly, Senator Bourke, uh, Deputy Murphy O'Mahony, Deputy Dirk, and Senator Swanick, and that's just committee members before just, we get to non committee members. I had to hit it, it was the ball was there, I had to hit it. Um, <laughs> just following on from Deputy Dunley, um, he's probably saved me some time because this is the issue I've been going on about for some time, and in fairness to Damien, Mr. McCallum. I asked this question a number of months ago, and you were very honest in your answer. And, uh, and Mr. McKenna, just to, I mean, a number of months ago, Mr. McCallum told me that essentially there was no way to absolutely reprioritize, you know, to, to distinguish totally, where there was no way to, the, when, with, with the delay of now 27 weeks, which by the way was at 24 weeks, we were told by the minister went down to 22 weeks, but now it's back up to 27 weeks. Might explain why that is. Um, but with short recalls versus routine smears versus those who are going for reassurance, um, this issue of prioritisation of women is a real concern out there. And there's no way, like, let's you know, be responsible here, but there's no way in saying that, I, I agree with you, there is, there is, it's obviously when you break down there's a low risk here. But having said that, there is a risk. And the risk is accentuated for some minority, very small amount of women, because of the 27 weeks, because they're further along the path and the transition from non-invasive to invasive. And it's at that critical juncture. And if you're caught in that 27-week delay because you're at that point of going from one stage to the other, this is a problem. And there's no point in saying it isn't. It is an issue. It's a consequence of decision-making and all of that, and I'm not appropriating blame. In fact, that's not what I'm getting at at all. But it does bring the concern of how rapidly we have to get this delay down, because it does create risk. And in fact, I've been told of cases of women who probably are in that point where they're moving from one to the other, and this delay has now pushed their diagnosis, consequently after being smeared, um, pushed it on. Um, and there's a, a, a concern that, as regards the impact of this disease on their health, the, the risk and the consequence for their health is obviously potentially worse because of this. I accept it's low risk, but Mr. McKinnon, what I've just said there is, in a very small amount of cases, very possible, isn't it? But there's nothing you've said that I could disagree with. Yeah. So I would just, and I know this, and I, I swear, no appropriation of blame, but I've had, you know, I've had, I've got details of, 
of people who are affected in this way and like they don't know their outcomes yet and then you obviously wish them the best but there's no doubt that that, that what I outlined there is, is how they ended up where they are and um, I, I just hope it doesn't give cause to a whole range of obviously smaller amounts but smaller amount of cases but a whole range of other issues for, for women's health. Just to say Deputy, uh, so a screening programme, a key performance parameter is to, to have an acceptable period in which the tests are read and so on. And uh, like some of us had the grey hair to be in around before cervical check was, was introduced. And we had. Well, Jim, uh, if you didn't get grey hair in the last couple of weeks, you never got to get it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had six, nine, we had 12 month uh, delays of totally undifferentiated uh, uh, tests. Some people were coming every year, some people weren't coming I at all. And, and the great contribution, and it's seen in the mortality reductions, the yeah. great contribution of the screening programme was to address that on a systematic basis. And we have to get the system back I agree. to the timeliness Listen, of that. I, I just wanted to follow on. It was my main question. I want to follow on from Deputy Donnelly, in fairness. I, I, I just wanted Dr McKinnon to confirm what I was saying. Um, a couple of quick questions. Um, the labs. Um, Dr Scully's report. I have a deep concern that Dr Scully's initial report in relation to the labs isn't accurate. Um, I have any information in relation to the outsourcing being far worse than what it has been reported. So in other words, we know of, in Dr Scully's report, that there was uh, uh, contracts which weren't being managed, that's called a spade a spade, we all know they weren't being managed, there was no quality control in place, and that there was uh, outsourcing, we now know, to some places where as they issued the contract, the HSE weren't aware that it was being outsourced again. We've known that from Scully's report. Is it true that the scale of this outsourcing to contracted labs in the main, but maybe one or two uncontracted un, uh, labs, is worse or is far more, there's far much more of it than uh, was reported in the Scully report? So, as you know, and I'm not adding anything to your knowledge in saying this, as you know, uh, uh, Dr Scally, having completed his report, um, undertook and the Minister uh, requested him to do a further detailed uh, report on the labs, and I think that is due imminently, and there will be findings in that around the extent of, of the issue that you've talked about. Um, uh, I don't think I'm inaccurate, am I? Well, I think that the likelihood is that there, there is... Uh, further labs that were involved in this. He will go beyond that, I think, in trying to establish just what the terms of that were, what the quality assurance arrangements were, and so on. So uh, the very fact that it's taking place is of concern, but we would be equally interested in just when that happened, in what context, how long it happened for him, what the quality and assurance arrangements When will that report be out? I'm told it is imminent. very imminent. This week? Uh, potentially this week, but we would go to government and the Minister has undertaken to share it with the women as well. It's, it's, and an, then it's an incredible though that in the initial process that this wasn't found out. So he had to actually go and dig way deeper to actually get an admittance that the contracts that were signed with these labs, they in turn had a whole range of arrangements to outsource to other labs, which for God knows how many years, no one had an absolute clue about. So quality control was just out the window. Well, well so the oversight is an issue. Um, the, the That's piece, an understatement now, the, to be the, fair. Uh, the piece of work that he's doing is also the quality assurance within the labs, and it's important that that is satisfied. And he identified this himself in his report, that this was an area he wanted to look further into. And I absolutely agree that it's important that he has done okay. that. Uh, uh, the, um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, those of us are into the detail, obviously, the differentiation between the 6,000 uh, women who have to, got the letters to be rescanned, and that's a secondary test, and as Dr McKenna has pointed out previously, I presume, it's quite a low risk, right? It's, it's, a, it's a low risk. The, the six, yeah, it's, it's, I, agree, I should have said that. It's extremely, extremely low, right? And then you've got the 1,000 where which by are women who obviously have had delays, which is a mod, it's not a, we, it's, the percentages are what the normal percentages are, it's just the fact that they've had a delay, which is the concern. I just say this, and I'm not, again, not appropriate blame, but 
How that was communicated on the one day, the differentiation between both of them, was a complete and utter disaster. It was a disaster. I don't know what went on. I ended up doing the public service duty at times going on national radio and local radio stations to talk about, to distinguish, and to talk and say very, very low risk, 6,000 letters. It's just an observation, but it was a disaster, whatever happened. There was a mix-up somewhere along the line there, and lads, I'm telling you, it was a disaster. It caused confusion, unnecessary. We didn't need it. On, to on this topic of all, we don't need additional confusion. So, uh, Taken board what the deputy said. Uh, just one proviso, because the man is here. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Peter McKenna did us all oh, I agree. Uh, great service. I was, following the, I, was, I was following your lead, going out and doing it myself, I have to be honest. Uh, but the initial communication and how it was taken, in whatever way it went out, it just it didn't work. Um, the ORCOG review. Can we get a guarantee that that will be done? I mean, this was meant to be done by May. May. Obviously, that was absolutely insane in thinking, firstly, that Scally was going to report in the time he was going to report, and secondly, that, that the, ORCOG review, um, uh, the ORCOG review was going to be done by May. Can we get confirmation that the ORCOG review will even be done within six months? Just six months, not even, you know. So that's the, and as you know, our college sure is, know what exactly what it is. is independent, so they've undertaken that it will take them six months to do it. The fact that the slides are now flowing to the lab to, to be reviewed, I think, will, will allow you know, us to but do that. Like, lads, uh, the, the facts are women are going off and getting their slides reviewed independently. The ORCOG review is never realistic in its targets or timelines. So I'm glad you're saying that it will be done within six months. Um, and this, on day 15 up in the High Court today is Ruth Marcy. Um, this is very, very sensitive uh, stuff. I mean, the fact that this woman is having to go through what she's having to go through with a terminal, terminal diagnosis is scandalous. Judge Meehan's report, all right, to set up the tribunal. I mean, the Taoiseach made these commitments on 6 1 News, the Taoiseach made these commitments to Vicky Field in face to face meetings. It's obviously it's a fact now that those commitments weren't, I'm being kind in saying that they weren't accurate or realistic. Um, as I understand it, the piece of legislation is highly complex. It's the first time this piece of legislation has been done to set up such a tribunal. We've Brexit and priorities of government. Like, there is a judge in the High Court who yesterday said that he's going to have to start doing two cases a day, one before lunch and one after lunch. I'm glad you had. Excuse me. Um, one before lunch and one, or one after lunch, because there's such a backlog that there isn't enough court space, there isn't enough judges. All right? This is, uh, this is scandalous that these women are having, and their families are having to go through this. What's the prioritisation as, as, as regards this legislation so that we can get this up and running ASAP to prevent these women having to go through the courts and at least as an Oireachtas be able to provide this um, tribunal so at least we can do our bit to honour what the Taoiseach didn't do. So there's an absolute priority attached to get this done and just to reassure uh, the resources and people that are, are working on this are not working on Brexit and the government has said Everything has to go on hold for Brexit except for this, and it's in the spring legislative programme. We have a draft general scheme developed that will be finalised, brought to government. There is a question for the committee here. Um, I believe that draft general scheme will be faithful to Judge Meenan's recommendations. There is a question for the committee as to the amount of scrutiny the general scheme should get. In my view, we could save some time by moving directly to the draft bill and bringing I it through the House. I think the committee would consider that. I think we would consider that, just if it helps speed, speed it up. And uh, uh, last uh, question. Um, I've been approached by a number of women who are not part of the 221, but are in exactly the same category. For different reasons, they're in a different cohort. They're part of the cancer registry cohort, which comes across, okay? They are really the same category as the two to one women. Now I've asked Minister Harris, and I want you to look at 
criteria to bring them in to be able so that they will fit under the same scheme um, as the two to one women as regards the allowances that they get the medical card and potential access if necessary to drugs etc there's going to have to be a way because there is it's it's not fair they come under the cancer registry cohort they have been let down in a similar way it's just they've come through a different channel there is we're not talking about huge numbers here we're talking about very 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 small numbers I've already given cases to the minister, one particular case um, recently. I'm asking you because they deserve the same opportunities as well as those who happen to come in under the 2 to 1. So would I ask you to please consider that. And the final, final, uh, final question is when it comes to um, the provision of the women's slides and the delays in getting them back to them. It seems to me that there's obviously been always been a problem here. The timelines have just kept moving all the time. What's the status of that now? Um, what's the status as regards those who have still suffered long delays? In some cases, by the way, the slides come back relatively pretty quickly. So why is there such a differentiation between some women getting them back quickly and some others not. And why is it continuing? That's my last question. Thank you, Chair. Deputy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to take the slides first, Deputy. So, they're definitely, I think I would have provided a report to, um, possibly it was the, the PSC, I can't recall, which the committees in terms of the position last time. And um, there was a number of requests subsequent to that committee meeting, then 54. Um, as I think, as, as was said earlier, there's, of the 118 requests, 109 have now been released. There has been variation between laboratories, you're right, in terms of, and in the early days, there was significant variation. We have a full-time client services team now that basically work with the labs, work with the um, solicitors involved to try and get them out as quickly as possible. The balance of nine, uh, one of those was in December, um, one at the end of November, I think, and the other balance were in January uh, 14th and 31st of January, the two dates. So we are working those through. So effectively now we are turning them around very quickly. There was delays in the very the early stages. Now? I think the average is around 25 days, if I recall exactly. I can confirm that maybe formally in writing, just I don't want to, to, to mislead the committee, but it's of that order. But I think what's important is there was huge variation. Initially, some women had to wait an inordinate amount of time. We had to get a whole team. We had never had this process before. And all of the debate, is, as you may recall, around getting a protocol that would ensure that the slide is protected, imaged, and so on appropriately. So. Um, Certainly, the, the numbers now that we're seeing through. There are a number of other requests, then, Deputy, outside that, that are to do with pre the, the screening program uh, in some of the hospitals that were running cervical screening prior to that, and we're trying to work with the solicitors. There's quite a number of those in two hospitals, I think. So they're a separate cohort that we're trying to work through. Okay. So on the, the um, women who have cervical cancer and who aren't in the 221, and, and uh, Damien may wish to add to this, um, so some of them, as I said out in my opening statement, will never have been screened and some of them will have been screened, but they all have cervical cancer. I think, and in, in fairness to yourself, you were, you were very um, active in highlighting this, probably the most pressing issue was the access to the drug uh, Pembro. Uh, and there was an issue there. Um, we have uh, put in place with the HSE a situation where, based on a clinical judgment taken with an individual clinician, there now is a route, if that is decided as the best pathway for a Thank woman, for that. There, there is a means to address that, and I think that that is progress. Um, what I would say in, in general um, is that, and it's part of our cancer strategy, there is much greater understanding now um, of the uh, holistic issues that arise for somebody that has cancer, uh, the psychosocial uh, supports that are needed in that situation, and it's core to the cancer strategy that we build not just a clinically e excellent cancer service, but that we build one that's patient-centered. And the patient advocates that are working with us on the cancer strategy are very much to the fore in identifying issues. I would also say that through the work of the liaison officers and the interaction with the women, uh, the 221 group, we have now uh, a very rich understanding of what the range of issues that arise are, and we would look to try and address those. Um, the final point I would make is that the, through the ORCOG process, we have identified that if there is a discordance that arises, that, and it's in my opening statement, if there is a discordance in that situation, that they would be uh, eligible for the same package of supports. But I would like to see us 
be able to say across the entirety of our cancer services. And indeed, we have good models on different disease types where there's a wraparound uh, support put in place, that we have that to a standard, that actually that's the standard of care and people, people can avail of that uh, as part of a mainstream cancer service. Um, Damien may wish to, to, to talk in, in more detail on it, but I think that would be our overall objective, that we would, we would move ahead on that basis. Can I just make one observation on that? I think by far and above the biggest request and the most significant number of people have sought counselling. Um, so that's I, actually I way over and above. And working with the Cancer Control Programme, we are looking to, to support what Jim said in terms of you know, providing more psychological intervention across, um, because that's clearly something that people I agree need to avail of. I agree. Okay, thank Sorry, you. Thank Senator you. Burke? Yeah. Just there, uh, thank you very much um, to all of the people here for their presentation here this morning. Just on the 221, um, you were saying that there was 118 requests um, and that leaves a ho over 100 where there weren't requests. I presume the slides would be available to any one of that 100 if they so required. Yes, they're just the ones that have been requested. But, but there's another 100 who haven't put in requests, but if they put in requests, I presume that they would be dealt with in a... In a oh, no, so. Uh, sorry, yes. Yeah, so some of those requests are not just people in the 221. So any woman is entitled to seek access to their slides. So there will be a mixture right. there of people who are in the 221 group and people outside that. That's just a total number, Deputy. We would have a breakdown if, if you wish to see it in terms of the, those that are in the 221 and those that aren't. But effectively, so that's the total request. If anyone requests their slide, effectively there's a process there and a protocol to deal with it. And we will try and work with the laboratories to expedite it then as quickly as we can. <coughs> It's also relevant that because of the ORCOG process, we have over a thousand women who have consented to their slides going into the ORCOG process. Okay. So there may be women who have not looked for the slide themselves because they are aware of the fact that it's going to be looked at through the ORCOG process. Okay, fair enough. Just on the numbers, um, the numbers have gone from uh, 280,000 up to um, uh, 270,000 um, in 2018. Um, have we any kind of idea as regards what it will level off at in 2019? And, you know, going back over, we've, you've given the figures for 2017. I presume the figure for 2016 and 2015 were, was still around 280,000. So I'm just wondering, um, have we the capacity now in view of the 80-odd thousand that we're waiting for to come back on, uh, that we've to review the... the um, can we deal with, if the figure levels out at 280,000 again this year, have we the capacity now to deal with both issues at the same time? I, can, I get Damien to talk on it, but actually it's worth saying that when we refer to capacity analysis, actually what we should be referring to is a demand and capacity analysis, because one of the uh, issues that has to be estimated is what will be the demand going forward, what will be the uptake rate for the programme, and then how much capacity we have to, to address that. So that's the piece of work that's underway, and Damien might. So, Deputy, yes, the, the numbers in 17 and 16 were consistent, and then obviously we had the spike in, in um, 18. Our estimate this year that it will be somewhere between 290, 300,000. It's impossible to get an exact figure. There's a range of factors, but we would expect that, um, there, that we will see, uh, continue to see a number of women turn up for a by invitation that perhaps previously may not have because of the heightened profile around cervical cancer and screening. That's the number. In terms of the, as Jim said, matching the demand and the capacity, clearly we have a difficulty with that at the moment. That's the, well, the backlog has arisen. Um, but we are constantly, if you like, trying to look at how we develop that, both with existing providers. We've done a trawl through the private providers. We've talked to other public sector organisations and are continuing to do that and follow up on any leads. But one of the challenges in the cytology market is that it's a declining skill set because as you move to HPV testing, right. you move from 100% cytology to 15% cytology. So basically people who work in the profession are moving and providers are moving away from it. So it's very challenging. We are continuing to try and source capacity from all possible angles, including developing our own in the medium term at the Coombe. Yeah. Well, I, that's what I want to move on to. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been doing very well in this country over the last number of years is getting jobs into this country. Yet we have a vital service where we were giving the work out to a side of the country and we, we didn't take a proactive um, approach to trying to keep that work within the country, keep the jobs within the country. And I'm just wondering, you know, you talked about um, five million being made available in relation to development, uh, development of lab services. Uh, what percentage now 
is actually being dealt with in this country at this, at this particular stage? So over 50% would be dealt with in the country, and that's between uh, one private provider and uh, the COOM at 9%. Um, what we are looking at in terms of developing a national cervical screening laboratory at the COOM is trying to build that up. That it isn't the five million is a capital allocation to try yes, and build the facility. And um, we also have revenue costs, which we've had allowance for through the service plan this year. The challenge, though, will be recruiting into that. It is very challenging in terms of the recruitment aspect of it, and it will have to be built up over time in order to increase the, num the amount that's in the public system in this country. So I think that will still take some time, and hence the need, uh, as I replied to, to Deputy Donnelly earlier, for the HPV tender to include a, a private partner to work with us from that tender. But if you take, if you did out a plan in relation to this whole area, I mean, could we set out a programme that over the next four years, that all of this work, that none of it would be going out of the country, that we could focus on trying to make sure that all of it stays within the country? So, so all I would say there, Deputy, is we're trying to balance the public and private piece to reduce the dependence uh, in terms of, of that. But equally, we need to be conscious that in terms of the skills that are needed, there's a huge dearth of those, unfortunately, in this country. So our strategy is to try and build up that public capacity, build a national surveillance screening lab. We've worked with the COOM on that. The COOM have committed and are working with us around that. Um, but that will take some time to develop. And where we need to be careful is we need to maintain a programme and we need to develop a programme. So as we do the tender for that, it's clear we will need to have a partner with us. Whether that partner is in Ireland or is outside Ireland, we can't control that in terms of EU procurement rules and so on in terms of that, that market. But our objective is clearly to build up greater presence here in the public system and then obviously within the procurement environment which we work in to see how we will have a partner that will help allow us to continue the programme as it is because the programme itself was at risk last October in terms of the contracts and so on, and then going forward in terms of HPV primary screening to ensure that we deliver a solution that will work for that for the immediate future as well. But is there anything that we can do in order to incentivise um, people to upskill and, and be trained into the system yeah, here? So around? we're working with the colleges and we started to discussions with them in terms of how we can maybe skill up, uh, how we can increase the manpower in that area uh, in order to ensure a, that we build up a public laboratory at the COOM uh, and also look at how it's a very small market, it's a very small number of people. Um, the total number of people involved is, is very small, but the impact obviously is huge if we have insufficient capacity. So we are trying to develop that, Senator, and we are committed to trying to make that work at the COOM. Okay. Uh, just on the other issue in relation to expertise in this whole area of um, cervical cancer, in relation to the medical and you know, the backup support groups, uh, are we now facing a challenge as well in relation to number one, retaining people, but also replacing people who will be retiring out. I mean, what, have we looked at that over the next four to five years uh, in relation to this issue? Because, for instance, you've taken a, in a number of areas in the medical service at the moment is over, I think, over 450, 500 uh, posts vacant in relation to consultants. This is an area where you need expertise. Uh, you're competing on the world market. I'm just wondering, where are we uh, at this stage in relation to long-term planning in that area? So this just maybe initially I'll speak and maybe colleagues might want to talk on the wider challenge in terms of particularly consultant manpower. Um, in terms of screening, um, there's two key roles. You have the screeners themselves and then you have the consultants, uh, pathologists that work in that area. There's a very small number of those skills in this country you're talking about, probably no more than four to five people that have that skill set. So we're looking at how we can develop that and ensure we have some succession planning around it and then a recruitment plan in relation to the new operation at the COOM. Um, the COOM also operates with uh, one of our universities in relation to training and run a very good school around that. So again, we're trying to continue that as well as bringing in the new skill set that will be needed around HPV alongside cytology. So we are working through that. The consultant um, issue, as you say, is a significant challenge across the board and Anne may wish to yeah, speak to I that. think in terms of consultant recruitment and retention, it is a big challenge um, and we have a lot of work going on under um, Professor Frank Murray within the HSE who's heading up the Medical Manpower and Planning Unit. Um, so he's doing a lot of work going around the country looking at exactly what the challenges are. We're looking at different models around recruitment of consultants to try and ease that pathway. But clearly there's a big issue in terms of some of the retention challenges as well and how we can make that career pathway attractive for people. So that is across the board, not just in this area. But in relation to the outside of the consultant, the other people, the other expertise that you require, I mean, do we see that there is going to be a challenge over the next 12 months, two years in relation to um, providing the service and providing comprehensive service every place 
um, that it's currently uh, provided. I mean, uh, do we see challenges in relation to having staff? So, so maybe just to say yes, in terms of screeners, and, and Dr McKenna may want to comment on this as well, in terms of screeners there are challenges around the world where people who work in cytopathology uh, are, are moving away because of the general trend away from cytopathology and into um, HPV testing. Having said that, we believe we will offer more opportunities in terms of the COOM, the public system. Uh, what most countries have done is try to train people so that they can operate both HPV and cytology, so they get both skill sets. And that's been the model from our experience of looking at HPV implementations in other countries. That's one of the pieces of learning, and we'll try and build that into our sort of workforce plan around screening. So as I say, while it's very small in numbers, we will do whatever it takes to try and ensure we provide career paths for people, provide skills to people, and that they can operate within that. And equally, we will have to look when we go to tender at ensuring that whoever we work with will be able to maintain those skill sets and have sufficient capacity that can deal with fluctuations. Because we have had previous fluctuations in the programme. The chair referred to the Jade Goody experience years ago, and in that period, huge backlogs emerged as well, and this can happen in the future. So we need also some capacity to flex the programme, that it's not so tight that if an issue arises that there isn't capacity to grow. So in terms of the public system, which we have direct control over, we are certainly going to make sure we develop that further, develop skills, work with the various bodies to try and do that, and there are discussions going on around that. Uh, all the time, and then separately in terms of the contract that we will need to put in place for HPV to make sure that whoever we select, one of those criteria will be in terms of ensuring that it's sustainable and also that we can flex the system somewhat uh, as, as we might need to in any case going forward. So the, the decision to export the work was not a popular one in the medical community, mm -hmm. and there are many of my colleagues, both in pathology uh, and in colposcopy, who would have advised against it, but it was necessary or considered necessary at the time. Uh, and this has lost a huge amount of expertise in this area. That's not something that can be turned around quickly. Um, training in this area is lengthy and intensive and uh, will take some time. It would be helpful, I think, uh, if there was a policy statement that uh, the intention in the medium to long term, or even indeed the short term, that this work would be repatriated and that for the foreseeable future um, every effort would be made to um, keep it here uh, within the jurisdiction. That would be helpful. Okay. Now, you can't compel people to train uh, in a particular area, yep. and the way the public service is constructed, it's, diffi it's difficult to incentivise specific areas. But I think a statement like that uh, would be reassuring and helpful. Okay. And finally, can I just say, in relation to the number of people who are going for um, screening outside of the cervical check, what percentage are we talking about there? I mean, the vast majority of people are in under cervical check, but you know, Deputy um, Kelly already referred to the people who are outside of cervical check. What percentage are we talking about in, in, in who are going outside of cervical check but are going for screening? Is it a very small? I we wouldn't have access that, that question, data. I, I, I would suspect it's relatively small, only on the basis that the number of providers who can offer that private, privately is quite small. Um, but I don't have any estimate. I don't have any numbers on that, Deputy. I, I stand to be corrected, but I don't think there's a private laboratory in the country uh, that is accredited to, to do cytology. As far as I know, in the private sector, they leave the country as well. Okay. But I say, I, I'm, I'm open to correction on that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Deputy Murphy O'Mahony. Thank you, Chair, and welcome everybody in this morning. And I suppose I, I take every opportunity that I get to uh, just ensure that women continue to get their smear tests done despite what's happening and despite delays. Um, so it's important, I think, that again gets out from this committee that um, women should continue to be tested. Um, Mr. President, there in your opening statement, you spoke about the independent clinical expert review and you spoke about uh, the women who are currently contactable. Can I just ask you what efforts are made? in relation to those who might not be immediately contactable? Like, do you just move on or do you make big efforts? I might ask the HSE just to come to that. I didn't catch that just because I was... Oh yeah, right, no, sorry. with regard to contacting women under the Independent Clinical Expert Review. So, in terms of the RCOG, the eligible group was 1,702 
and 1,072 have consented, and that includes next of kin. Uh, so that's the, the eligible group. If people, while we did have a cut-off date, if someone chooses to come in late, you know, we, we would try and facilitate it where possible up to a certain point. Um, those slides have started to move. Um, so we would have contacted all of those. That would, everyone would have received two letters as, as a reminder, and we had a helpline that would have received a significant number of calls. Um, we would have also dealt with people who, you know, clearly were anxious. They are all women who have had cervical cancer, or um, partners or next of kin of people who had cervical cancer. So we would have tried to deal with those as well in terms of explaining what it was and what the process was. Okay, so to it was people. a big effort made. Yeah, like yeah. we have a full team that's dedicated completely separately working on this to all of the other. Uh, streams of work that are going on around the programme. So we brought a completely new team in to manage this, um, and there's a full, you know, database set up, a helpline set up, and there's both uh, basic information and, and clinical access as well. So we have a consultant who comes in and works part time for us to help if there are complex calls where people are worried or concerned or distressed, maybe even as a result of receiving the letter, that they can have a conversation with someone around it and what it means. Okay. So we've tried to support it as best we can. That's good to hear. And just in a few sentences, how? how why do you think things are disimproving rather than improving? Why are things getting worse rather than better with regard to waiting time? The backlog deputy, is it, in terms of the backlog? Yeah. So, so there are two factors, I suppose. One is, that in some ways, unfortunately, it's very simple. One is the demand is continuing to, to operate slightly higher, albeit has abated somewhat from the, the peak at which it would have operated. And secondly is the capacity um, is constrained. So, without going back over the, the earlier pieces, we are trying to source all possible capacity um, with existing providers, so the people who are currently working with the programme where it's much easier to connect them in, for, for want of a better word. We're also looking outside, we've done a trawl of the market, uh, and we've also talked to other jurisdictions, Northern Ireland, Scotland, um, and we're in contact with some of the trusts in England who would operate this service to see what capacity is available. Um, it isn't just a simple plug-in, unfortunately, for a new provider, yes. so there's quite a lot of work involved and there's a lead-in time to do that. And we continue to have meetings. We have one this afternoon with a, a possible lead, with a, a, and we've looked in Europe, in France and Holland, and we have some possibilities there. But it's very hard to, to get these over the line in relation to increasing the capacity that's available to the programme, which ultimately will help. And, and the steps I outlined earlier are to try and mitigate that, the prioritisation of colposcopy, where the labs would have excessive backlog by running HPV first. It effectively triages those that might have the greatest risk. So we're trying to just minimise the impact uh, where it is possible. But it is, I'm not going to say it's easy. It is very challenging. Globally, we have this issue. And secondly, you know, our own environment probably presents challenges to some of the the people who are looking to work with us, but we do have leads that we're continuing to pursue. Yeah, I suppose it's just amazing that it's going on so long now and still there's no improvement. In, in fact, we're going backwards and th there's huge interest, as you probably saw in Morning Ireland this morning, was the first item on. Yeah. That doesn't happen easily. So the public are really, really holding on to this and, and I, you probably are doing your best, but it's just, it's going on so long now that I feel things should be you know, improving rather, rather than disimproving. And just uh, with regard to Minister Harris, and I know he's not here now to defend himself, but do you think that he got it wrong inviting women to uh, be tested without being called? I mean, he obviously um, didn't think it through, and I believe at the time even his own officials recommended not going down this road. So do you think he got it wrong? So, Deputy, I did deal with this at the start and his own officials did not recommend against this in fact we worked with him on this right and that is incorrect um, I, I know you're you're just reporting what has been said yes but the advice from officials was and I, I set it out at the start of the meeting um, that women would present to their GPS because of the degree of anxiety and they were ringing the helpline to say that and to ask for the state to pay for the cost of that and we were faced with a situation where some women might be able to afford to do that and some women wouldn't. And in a rapid situation, the decision was made and agreed with the IMO that there would be a fee made available to GPs for that. In fact, in quite a percentage of situations, women met their GP, had a conversation and arrived at a conclusion that they didn't need to have another test. And that, that was a very good Just thing to, to put in, in yeah. place to reassure people. Some women with their GP decided to have another test. Um, but I think, in fairness, if we go back to that point, um, lots of us felt it was the right thing to do. 
and I'm not confining that to the civil servants and the minister, lots of commentators, lots of people involved in this, in trying to put a response in place to the anxiety that was there, uh, to be totally uh, dispassionate and hard-headed and say, absolutely not, there's no need for this, we're not doing it, would have for me, would have been just as big a mistake as to, to have done yeah. uh, what we yeah, did do. I agree with that. But when that was done, there was a, a review put in place, which was that the decision would be reviewed after three months. And as I mentioned earlier, as soon as we had the benefit of the Scali report, which was reassuring to the community around the laboratories, then the minister made the decision to bring that to an end. But surely there should have been adequate resources then put in line. I mean, but it, just but it is linked to what you've just talked to Mr McCallion yeah. about, because the financial resources are there. The issue is whether you can get the capacity globally uh, to, to increase in the way that you want to. And the other thing that is worth, uh, a point that is worth making, so the um, other contribution to the backlog is the increased uptake, not from retests, but from co people coming New for the people. first time. Yeah. So it's not that the whole of the backlog is, is based on the retest. Um, a very good response from the public, which is an awareness of the importance of cerv cervical cancer and being screened, um, albeit in the face of a controversy and a crisis that none of us would have wanted, is forming part of the demand for the programme. And that's a demand that the HSC are struggling to try and increase capacity to deal with. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a, a following on in that, where has it been suggested that perhaps officials had advised against uh, the process being followed? Where did that come from? We're here anyway. All of our, all of our um, clarifications, uh, media, um, PQs and committee presentations and the Minister's own statements are fully consistent with the advice that he got, which was that um, the advice informed his decision. He didn't make the decision contrary to the advice at all. And it hasn't been attributed to anybody in particular in the media or anywhere else? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it, sometimes these things take hold and uh, they're not always based on fact. Well, the, the reason I raise it, you know, this particular issue causes a great deal of stress and anxiety for women. And anything that raises questions about the integrity of what is being followed will cause more uh, distress and concern for women. And I, I would just like that to be borne in mind that whatever is done, uh, we do it uh, with a view to addressing the issue, which is, you know, which we know about. <clears throat> Can I ask about the 221 women? What, what, at what stage are their particular cases uh, now standing? In terms of the progression of, of their illness? Yes. So uh, there is a report which the HSC has done on that, which looks both at, at what they've been through, which is very significant, and also what their current uh, health status is, and, and maybe the HSC and would, the would just talk to that. Yes. And also, we, we worked with the patient group, the 221 group, to develop a report which brought a factual position, a current position, in relation to, and maybe we can circulate the report, it's publicly available to, to the committee because it may answer just some of the questions. Um, but the purpose of the report was primarily just to inform us in relation to the supports and what's there. It set out the various procedures that people have had, um, the difficulties and also then the current health status for people. Uh, what it can't do, Deputy, those representatives, suppose the individual journeys that people have had and we met with the group. Uh, and clearly if you bring a group of people together, um, both women and, and those next of kin that have lived through cervical cancer, it is... You know, people have lived through a very, very difficult experience, and the report is simply a factual position in that it doesn't get into and can't reflect um, the experiences, the traumatic experiences many people have had through the disease. So maybe if we circulate that report to you, it'll, it'll answer those questions. I'd be grateful. Uh, thank you. And can I, can, I, can, I, can I move on? In relation to the 78,000 uh, currently on a waiting list, uh, for review, I think that's for, for uh, look back and review. Uh, what is the progress? What well, you know, six months is a waiting time, or whatever the case may be. What's the, the long term projection on that? At what stage do we come to a situation whereby you know we, we, we over, overtake uh, that waiting list? So, what I was saying earlier, Deputy, is our challenge here is to find capacity until we get capacity. Clearly, we can't get ahead of that. So, in other words, we need laboratory capacity that can do this work. 
Um, that laboratory capacity is seriously constrained, both within the existing providers that we have, the three providers, but even internationally, because, as I mentioned earlier, laboratories in countries are moving to HPV, and that brings about significant challenges because they're reducing cytology, and people who are in implementation mode are not in a position to provide services to us. We have trawled, um, I suppose, globally, really, in relation to trying to find providers that could work with us to beef up the capacity we have, and at that point, I suppose, if we get to that point, then that's when we will be able to, as you say, catch up on the curve. But at the moment, we're clearly... Um, it, is a, it is a battle to, to get ahead of that, but we are trying to look in all possible sources, both public and private providers, here and internationally, to try and do that. Of that 78,000, how <coughs> can they be assured uh, that uh, you know, everything is happening that can happen uh, to, to shorten the, the, the waiting time and at the same time ensure that their health does not deteriorate or is put at risk? So, so there are a couple of things, Deputy, in, in relation to that. So one is in terms of trying to mitigate those most at risk groups we would have talked about earlier. So people who need a smear from colposcopy would have a higher priority. Um, and those have been prioritised by the laboratories, clear instructions and given. have you any indication as of yet how their cases are progressing, those so, who have the high priority? So those are being monitored by the um, programme in terms of the laboratories that provide the services at the moment in terms of colposcopy. They're small in number, but they're easily identifiable, and those are being pulled out and prioritised by the labs. The other thing that and we've done no, is... And, and the, the, that they eliminate their waiting time then? It, it reduces their waiting time down, yeah, in By terms of what's there. Uh, I don't have those figures here, Deputy, but I can maybe get them for you if, if you wish. Yeah, but yeah. basically it, it's significantly shorter in terms of the, the wait times around colposcopy. But the numbers are relatively small but, but important in terms of uh, priority. The other thing that we've done is where a laboratory has particular challenges at any period is we have sanctioned what's called HPV, uh, prioritisation, so that triages the outstanding slides and smears to ensure that those that might have be identified as having the high risk types of HPV move into cytology earlier. So that means at least those that might have a greater risk of abnormality move into cytology quicker and those results will move, move quicker. We did that before Christmas and, and authorised that in, in relation to one of our labs. So we've tried to prioritise the um, testing and the groups at risk as best we can within the confines of, of how the programme is structured. And then, as I said earlier, the second thing is where we're trying to source capacity from whatever means, private or public, um, as we grow our own. But growing our own will take some time. It's not going to provide a solution to the backlog. How about the, <clears throat> the change over to HPV? What, what, what progress is taking place, or has taken place, or is about to take place there? So, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> So basically, Deputy, we, we, are, we have a project, and we have a dedicated team working on that. Um, there are two key things that we're working through at the moment. One is to ensure we stabilise the programme, because in order to move to a new test, you must have a stable programme. You can't just jump from the, the current scenario to, to the new testing regime. And secondly is in terms of the tender. So we ran our pre-tender market engagement before Christmas, which invites the market to come in to look at what's available. We've used a process called competitive dialogue, which will allow us to engage in dialogue with people who are interested in providing this service, because there is a risk that if we went to tender in our environment here in Ireland, that people may not bid or may not. We could end up having run a procurement process with no one to work with us. So that will allow us, we believe, to secure a partner to work with us. The advertisement for the next stage of that, the, the EU tender, will be going up in the next number of weeks um, and we're moving along all the other pieces that we can such as the training materials, education materials, communication, the IT system changes and so on that need to be made in order to go live. We've also visited, the team that are working on this have either visited or had conference calls with the people who've gone live on this in Australia, New Zealand, Holland, Wales um, and also discussed it with England, Northern Ireland and Scotland who were in the middle of their implementations. Most of those are planning to go live over the next number of years. Uh, I would have mentioned earlier that the key critical path on HPV testing going live is when we run the tender to see how long the partner will take to establish and to link into our system. So it's at that point we'll have greater stability in terms of a date for the programme for HPV testing going live. Sufficient interest has been, as far as you are concerned, sufficient interest has been uh, expressed to uh, reassure you that uh, you'll, you'll, this is the way to go and that it will work. 
Yeah, H HPV primary screening undoubtedly is the way to go. HIC will it's approve accuracy. it. It's accuracy. It's accuracy is much higher. It's not infallible. It's it has much a, higher. <coughs> uh, I believe, I don't have the test rate here, but uh, Peter or colleagues may have the actual difference, but the, there is still a false negative rate, as is described in screening. Um, I think it's a factor of maybe 15 versus 25 per cent, but maybe we can confirm that maybe back with you. But it isn't an infallible test, but it is a much more reliable test and it's because what you're doing is you're prioritising women who have a particular form of HPV, which would account for a large proportion of cervical cancers, but not all of them. I don't know whether Peter may have... Do you have some idea of the accuracy, the difference? Um, other than to confirm that it is a lot more accurate, um, you're, I, I think the figure is you'll, you, you will miss 40 to 50 per cent less of women who have abnormalities. Of the 20 per cent that the cytology yes, yes. Sorry, Deputy Durkin, just on that, because yeah. this is important, um, and, and I, I, you can't give us the figures now, but I'm conscious that during deliberations, figures get thrown around, and, yeah. and if women are watching this, and in the interest of putting factual information onto the, the, the record, perhaps you will circulate for us. We, we can because do that, it, yeah. you know, it, it, where, there's a, where there's room for any doubt, I think it's not fair for, for people. Yeah. Prior to the decision being made, and the decision was made prior to the controversy, uh, HICWA conducted a health technology assessment of the HPV, so we can make that available to the committee as well. Absolutely, and I think that that would be, rather than speculate, I think that that would be very helpful if that's... Yes, it would. Okay. Yeah, we're coming um, we, 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 yeah. Um, the 20% the um, uh, um, portion of, of, of the 80% accuracy, 20% doubtful. Uh, uh, and you, the, and, and um, Dr. McKenna says 50% uh, of those uh, should be narrowed down into a more accurate uh, area. Can I, can, and, and when are we likely to be able to rely? Uh, um, tenders steered and all that sort of thing on the the, the HPV system. So I would and taking and taking the, the women out of the the, the cytology program in in order to eliminate the doubt, the concerns, the worry, the stress, and and the the the, the continuous query over it. So it's probably important to restate, Deputy, in terms of the test. The future test has a HPV test, but it still has cytology for 15% of those. Uh, and we can provide information such as the HICWA report that, that Jim referred to that, that sets out how that works. So while it's a more reliable test, none of those tests are 100% accurate and there's a defined rate on that. We can circulate that just so that people who are watching are clear what those percentages are. And will there be a look back in relation to the, the HPV tests as well, for instance, if in the cases where they're not entirely accurate? 100%. Uh, we can't get 100%. So, what what protection would be for the ones that who may not be accurate uh, and fall off the the, the 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 shelf, as it were, in in, in that test? Uh, there is a process underway at the moment to establish what is the correct way to conduct an audit of interval cancers, um, and uh, this is taking place in the the various cancer programs. Uh, this has this process has begun and it will make recommendations as to what is the appropriate way, the best way, to see how interval cancers can be audited, irrespective of the methodology of screening, whether it's cytology uh, or HPV. The, the process will be the same, should be the same. That's a recommendation, Deputy, of Dr. Scally's report, so we're reporting on progress on that through the implementation yeah. plan. And we've resolved all the other difficulties, such as non-reporting to the, the, the patient on time as to, to uh, that's all cleared and we're not likely to trip over that again, are we? But the new, um, the new process, the new clinical audit process that, that Dr McKenna has referred to will reflect on all of the learning and ensure it's absolutely in line with open disclosure and it's a fully robust process end to end. Any uh, um, response from any quarter as to the women who may have had uh, gone to uh, the private sector and had private tests done and to have, have you looked at, made any comparisons as to uh, what their success or, or failure rate was and whether or not uh, any outstanding issues arise? 
No, Deputy. I mean, I think we, we would. You mean access to laboratories offering a service to people privately is an outside yes. program? Yes. We wouldn't have access to data. I think we were just saying earlier the number of women who would have gone the private route we would believe is relatively small, and that there's. I don't think there's a. a if there's only probably one of our existing laboratories would have a very small private capacity. I know there's a laboratory in Northern Ireland, but it would be very limited in terms of opportunities for people to get a, a smear read privately. How, so we how limited would it be? For instance, would it be 10 people, 20 people, 100 people, whatever? We wouldn't know, Deputy. I, I'm just saying. I think indicatively we would expect it to be small simply because the number of laboratories offering the service is very limited. But the numbers See, that would go privately is very small. We I'm would not, not have access to yeah, that. I'm, data. I'm, and what I'm trying to get at is, is, is to make a comparison yeah. as to what their experience was. Uh, would proportionately uh, women who went that route, uh, maybe prefer to go that route, would they have been reassured at an earlier date? Would they have had a more accurate uh, uh, test? Or what? What's the case? Yeah. So, so I, they, they probably would have got the results quicker. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But in relation to would they be less likely to subsequently develop cancer, the answer is they're an entirely different population who would be much less likely to develop cancer anyway, irrespective as to the quality of the testing. I think that's, that's uh, useful information. I think... Sorry, um, Deputy Durkin, I'm conscious of time. Uh, I know, I'm, I'm conscious of all the time. I was sitting here all morning. I understand well, Madam that, and I'm not trying to unduly <laughs> hurry you, be, just remind you uh, that your, I, your colleague I, is waiting can, to can I, as well. Can I, can, I, can I ask, in relation to the Scali report, uh, the extent to which you remain uh, satisfied as to its accuracy and uh, the issues raised uh, being addressed in the fashion uh, suggested uh, and their ability uh, to deal with the issue that has become such a problem for so many people, so many families, so many women. So we're unequivocally uh, implementing all 50 of Dr Scally's recommendations and we have put the whole of uh, the mandate of the department, the HSC, uh, behind that. We have a full robust process. Uh, with public reporting on how well that's going. And then, as we mentioned earlier, Dr Scally is due to do a further report on the laboratories, and, and we await that. It should, it should be with us very shortly. The retaining of, of, of the services within the country, and the use of labs within the country, and the development of the necessary technology to ensure that the laboratory uh, facilities uh, of, 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 of the order required are available. We have, we, have, we have laboratories in this country which are fairly sophisticated, some of them located in my own constituency in fact, and I, I have raised queries about these in the past. We tend to quite regularly refer abroad uh, where we have a lack of capacity at home, and it is the merging of the, of the requirement with the capacity that has been referred to already that I would like to ask in my last question. How are we working on that? And are we, are we working towards a particular uh, deadline and, and a, a objective? So, so I think we've set out that we are working with the Coombe Hospital um, to develop a national screening uh, laboratory there. Um, so in terms of capacity, it's the, I suppose, the number of available personnel that is a problem regardless of the number of facilities. We just won't be, you know, it wouldn't make sense to try and staff too many. So we have a plan to develop a national centre. We're investing five million in that and working very closely with the COOM to develop that so that we will have greater capacity within our own system. By when? Um, at the moment, at just at the stage of planning it. So we have to develop that lab. They currently don't have it. Um, so that will require investment, investment in terms of the actual infrastructure, the building, the equipment. Yeah, could I, could I ask, uh, Madam Chairperson, that uh, particular emphasis be put on that? Mm -hmm. Uh, with a view to, to, to do, doing that and keeping in mind uh, Dr McKenna's uh, uh, um, uh, wish that you know that it, the, the, to retain services uh, nationally and to train the, the, the personnel nationally is of vital importance. Thank you Deputy Durkin and I'm conscious that Deputy Smith has been waiting very patiently but as is the, the convention at this committee I will take committee members first so Deputy O'Connell and can I ask Deputy O'Connell we have all been doing very you know, making every effort to keep within our time I haven't given out any gold stars yet so this could really be your opportunity <laughs> my the, early, the, early, the early starters were, were the biggest offenders uh, I, I live my person. life Deputy looking for gold chair looking for gold stars um, is it 10 minutes slot is it? 10 minutes please I was close um, to it you can manage. Thank you all um, for coming in again this morning. Um, 
has a new Director of Public Health been appointed, is my first question. Um, can you give me the status of the Independent Patient Safety Council, um, if, if you have that information for me? Um, I'm conscious of, I don't want to repeat questions that were asked already this morning, and I have been keeping an eye on what's been going on. Um, in terms of the eradication of cervical cancer, and we've spoken here before about um, about um, the, the, the Australians having a target to eradicate, and they're on, on track to eradicate cervical cancer within 10 years, or within 10 years from when they started. Um, how are we doing um, with our target? I know it was discussed here, and you couldn't give a date for HPV testing superseding, or technically superseding, not getting rid of, of cervical screening. I know you have not able to give a date on that, but I'm very conscious that on the, the last, on the 10th of October, um, Dr. Denton, the lady, I think from Scotland, who was in with Dr. Scally, said from the moment, the inception of, of the idea of bringing in HPV, that theoretically, she said, um, within a year, um, you could have the system up and running. So are we on target, or can you just give me a little bit um, of information on that? Um, in terms of, and I know it's very hard to quantify, and we have the backlogs of screening, and I know that was dealt with already this morning, but in terms of knowledge and awareness of cervical cancer, and I refer to, I don't know, was it was 10 or 15 years ago, the Jade Goody effect, and when, it, when, when she tragically died at a very young age from cervical cancer, there was a massive uptake in the UK and, and in Ireland of the cervical program. In, I suppose in, in light of all that's happened, can anyone tell me, is, is, it, is it true to say that more women in the cohort are engaging and they're, I suppose, more aware of, we, we heard from the victims here, but also from the medical evidence that, you know, there was gaps in, in, in people's information and perhaps there was an over-reliance on, on smears without um, consideration of um, symptoms such as bleeding and discomfort. So um, if, if someone could perhaps um, speak to that point. Um, I'm just jumping back there to the move to HPV testing. Um, the transitioning period between the cervical check program that we have now and then to move it to the, the, the more robust, more accurate, but, def, but not perfect, HPV screening. And obviously someone just mentioned 15, I think it was Mr. McKenna uh, mentioned, and they would require 15% cytology. Um, in terms of our lab, um, capacity here, and I'm very conscious of Quest Laboratories, and I, I just didn't bring Scally's report with me this morning, but there was an issue um, with the ISO accreditation in those labs, and how Quest in particular, I think, um, had accredited themselves to an American standard over the ISO standard. So when it comes to where we're moving, in terms of transitioning to HPV testing, what my question is, is can we as a committee be sure that the contracts will be correct and that the, the people, be they in Ireland or elsewhere, that get the contracts, that there will be no discrepancy between the standards in the contract and the standards in the labs? Um, that will do just for the minute. Uh, just another couple of questions. I might take yeah. the Patient Safety Council and then I pass the, the remainder over. Uh, the proposal on the patient say it's very well advanced. The Minister signed off the proposal and we're just yeah. finalising the membership and the precise terms of reference on that. Important to say it will have a very strong component of patients being involved uh, around that council. The appointments, um, we have made three key appointments and yes, we have appointed uh, an interim director of public health where we go out for a permanent competition, so that's Dr Caroline Mason, uh, who's working with this Dr Lorraine Doherty, who's here today in her second week in the role as the clinical director for the cervical check programme, um, and also we have appointed a uh, laboratory quality assurance lead, um, Dr David Nuttall, who has joined us and has actually commenced, I think, this week, uh, today. <laughs> So they are three critical appointments that were identified as absolutely necessary in terms of the implementation of the SCALI recommendations. Um, in terms of just... So, uh, sorry, uh, we never had a quality assurance lead before, did we? 
uh, yeah, sorry, the pathology lead wasn't, uh, that role, that clinical role wasn't in place, it was a gap identified. So we did have quality, quality assurance people, they're still there, but the laboratory quality assurance, that sort of higher level medical uh, consultant level role what, wasn't What there. were they doing, Mr McCallion, if they weren't um, looking at the quality of the lab? What quality were they assessing? So, so no, sorry, it's not that they weren't, uh, just the quality assurance role that was there would have looked at the laboratory QA as well, but this role was a gap identified in terms of that consultant level experience that wasn't in the programme, that was a gap identified by, by Dr Scanlon. So they weren't up, the, we the people we had in charge of quality weren't up to scratch essentially? No, I, I think in fairness that wouldn't be fair to comment on them in that sense. I think that what he identified is there's an additional skill set that's needed in order to provide that a greater level of expertise around it. I think it would be unfair to say some of the individuals in the role... I think, like, but I think by saying an additional skill set needed is essentially not up to scratch. It depends. No, I think it's a different role, so it's a more yeah. senior person. It's a more yeah. senior post at a consultant level that we didn't previously have. And it, uh, it was needed, clearly. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Who is next? Is there anyone else? Yeah, just in terms of maybe the transition, and, and Damien can pick up on some of the, of the other points, but I think in terms of the transition, and, and we've discussed this today, the, one of our key challenges is that we're trying to transition to a new model, and yet we have to address the old model. So in yeah. terms of the backlog, we can't transition until we address that. And there's, there's a tension there in terms of moving to something without clearing the backlog on that. Um, I'll ask Damien maybe to talk about the other elements of that. Yeah, just on, on the HPV testing, Deputy, the uh, plan there is there's two key things that we need to move on in order to um, move to primary HPV screening. So one relates to the selection of a partner to work with us in terms of, and I mentioned earlier that we uh, had a pre-tender market engagement before Christmas. Uh, I was saying to Deputy Durkin that we had positive input from that because obviously one of our concerns was would we get a partner, to be honest, in terms of working with us, and that would have put the whole project at risk. Um, so I think we, we're more optimistic as a result of that. We have an advertisement in place now in the next number of weeks. There's a separate team then that's working full-time on this in terms of all the other aspects, so the IT system changes, the communication, education, the uh, development of materials for health professionals. There's eight work streams in total, laboratory reconfiguration, procurement and, and quality assurance standards for the new test. So those are all being progressed. The key thing in terms of determining a date, I was saying earlier, is until we get to a point where we're clear that we select a partner and the timescales in which they can work with us, that's the point at when we're able to give greater certainty in relation to a date to, to move that uh, programme and project live. Thank you. Probably everything that. Um, just in terms. Mr. McKenna, sorry, Mr. McKenna. Yeah, I had an additional question for you. So go yes, ahead. Yes, you, you did mention symptomatic patients, mm. patients who are bleeding, and thank you very much for doing that. Um, you will not. We will not reduce deaths from cervical cancer by focusing on uh, cytology alone. Uh, we do need to have rapid access to symptomatic gynaecological clinics. At the moment, uh, there are possibly. 28, 30,000 women waiting for gynaecological outpatient appointments. And you must bear in mind that whereas 80 to 90 women die of cervical cancer, 80 to 90 women will also die of endometrial cancer, and nearly 300 women will die um, of ovarian cancer. Cervical cancer is not the only cancer uh, that will kill women, although it clearly has been the focus of, of our attentions uh, recently. Uh, so we must uh, have uh, resources to improving access for symptomatic women uh, in, in gynaecological um, clinics. Uh, w without that, no matter how much resources we have in cytology and colposcopy, uh, there's only so far that we can get. Thank you. Um, just in terms of audit, and perhaps that was brought up before, audit, we stopped her, you stopped the auditing on the cervical yes. back, back, and then you referred there to um, the auditing of interval cancers, and that my understanding is what you're saying is that you'd have a sort of a, 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 a standard way of auditing, Correct. is that what you're saying, Correct. as opposed to sort of different areas having different ways of going. How are we on that system of how well, to Well, that audit? process has begun. Uh, there is a steering committee which would establish principles and then there are subcommittees of that looking at bowel, breast and cervical cancer as to how to audit. Uh, their work has just begun and they will be making recommendations. It will probably be a process that will take three to four months. Thank you. And just finally, I know it was brought up here last week and it's brought up here again this morning. Um, in terms of the, the, the free smear, not the, the additional option to have a smear, and there seems to be constant reference to was it a good idea or was it a bad idea, and I'd just like to make a point to the committee that um, 
as somebody who worked, works sometimes in the community and who engages a lot with people in community health, there was a massive demand out there when there was an information vacuum. Um, people with private health insurance were presenting in private clinics in the early days of this scandal, asking for, to pay for a smear to be done. The logic of it, whether it was right or wrong, it was, it was their free choice to do that. And I know many women who paid. And my belief is, at the time, and I totally support the idea of that um, reassurance smear being offered, that there was a gap, a, a class gap forming, where in an information vacuum, and when we were all, we still are all up to our necks in this, but when it was very, very stressful here, and um, for all of you and, and for, for members of the committee and, 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 and the public, um, that a two-tiered system had emerged where, where some women who could afford were presenting in private clinics and other women who were on the medical card um, or hadn't the means were, were, were feeling somehow disenfranchised. So it's all fine. Hindsight is wonderful and we'd all love to have it, um, but um, it's all fine looking at this um, with, through the lens of all the information we have now. But as somebody who was engaging with groups of women and who was engaging with GPs, there was a massive discrepancy arising between the types of people that were getting a free smear and not. And although now in hindsight it may have caused um, to, or, um, uh, contributed to the backlog, I think if we hadn't done it and if you, you hadn't done it at the time, it would have been a far more um, stressful situation for women and I think it would have increased the amount of fear. Um, thank you. Comment and, and part of the reassurance and, and take some of the stress out we can see in the uh, difference between the number of women who had a consultation with their GP and the number that went on to have the retest. So there were a lot of women who sat down with the GP and were reassured through that consultation, which was paid for by the state, which mm -hmm. was a good outcome in terms of managing the anxiety that was there. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Deputy O'Connell, for your class analysis there with the health service as well. Deputy Smith, you have been very patient. <laughs> thanks, uh, Chair, and thanks everybody here for, for your answers. Um, I came in with one question. I've got about three or four now, but I won't be long. Um, the first one is um, on the issue that Dr. Peter McKenna raised about the decision to export the uh, screening process way back in the day, I think it was 2008. That it, it wasn't um, it wasn't a popular decision, and I've read over the record from the Academy of Clinical Science and Laboratory Medicine and the Medical Laboratory Scientists Association, who resisted it very fiercely at the time, um, and they contended that uh, if if there was a, a program of intensive training of new clinicians, that we could have kept the service at home. Now, we didn't, and we all know that, that the rest is history. But I just would like to ask, and maybe it's for um, Mr. Breslin to answer, when Dr. McKenna requests of us that there should be a policy statement, uh, that there is a, a willingness or a will or a, a, a political ambition to repatriate the service, does that come from the Minister? And I think the Minister's statement is already made on this subject. Indeed, I think maybe the Taoiseach also, uh, which is that it would be desirable that that would take place. But is it a policy statement? That's that's when, once the Minister talks on the subject, he, he determines policy. Uh, the one caveat in that, which I know uh, Peter would agree with, is that we have to continue with the programme. So the repatriation has to be consistent with us trying to match the demand there is uh, for testing. So we can't do this overnight. Uh, we couldn't do it in one go, and we have to build up the services in the Coombe for us to be able to achieve that. Um, so it will be a progressive development, and it will certainly see the balance shift towards more public activity. Um, but no, it is desirable. Dr. McKenna said it would be very helpful if there is a policy statement. And, and the minister is on the record in the House, I think, in relation to his support for is that. Is that the same as a policy statement? It is absolutely. Okay. So there you have your policy statement, Dr. McKenna. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on it because I think it's, it goes to the heart of um, everything that went wrong with this service. And I, I probably have to say this because I get a lot of criticism for it. That when I take the angle I'm about to take. I'm accused of being uh, uh, negative about the cervical check service. I am not at all. I'm a recipient of that service. I'm a complete advocate for it, and I'm not trying to do it down. I'm trying to forensically examine what went wrong, why it went wrong, and therefore how, how we should deal with things like this in the future. Which brings me to my next question. I think it was um, Mr McCallion mentioned 
The EU rules on public procurement around um, being able to deliver the service, and I, my ears pricked, uh, not least because we're surrounded with problems with public procurement issues in health at the moment. Um, could you explain or tease that out a little bit for me, please? And one of the things I was looking at, uh, the services that are provided for screening around Europe, because it struck me as very strange why we would just always go to the United States instead of trying to source from Finland or Germany or other parts of, of, of Europe where they have, you know, state-of-the-art um, clinical laboratory testing. So could you explain what the problems are? So I suppose, Deputy, at the moment in the public system here, the COOM run for about 9% and then we have two, two providers that provide roughly the balance equally between them. Um, in terms of moving forward with the, the new tender for HPV, we've made a commitment that we're going to invest in the COOM to build up the public capacity, but we know that's going to take time both in the construction side, but probably, to be honest, more importantly in terms of the skills and developing and, and all the things that you've alluded to earlier. But we're committed to doing that and to building that up over time, and the COOM are committed to working with us on that. Um, and that's come from the most senior levels with, within the COOM. So from a positive perspective, that will help. In the meantime, we have to run a tender then to find a partner that will work with us as we've developed the COOM over a number of years um, to help us provide the new test, the new screening service. And under that tender, we will offer that tender out through the, the market. We're using a process that will allow us to have a dialogue because there was a real risk that we would go to the market and no one would respond in light of our difficulties here in Ireland. We had a serious concern in that. We're more confident through the approach we've taken now that we will secure people who are interested in working with us. In that, we ran what's called a pre-tender market engagement before Christmas where we seek the views of the market and then we're able to build that into our tender process and our advertisement for that will be placed in the next number of weeks. And then we are hopeful that we will see people respond to that, which will allow us then to move forward in terms of HPV primary screening. But I guess just to be clear, at the moment we are dependent on finding a partner to work with us from wherever. And it's, it's a case then the process will look at who is the most suitable in relation to the service, the quality and, and so on around that over the next number of years while we build up the public provision to try and balance that and, and not be as dependent, I suppose. Uh, on, the, on the private sector as we move forward. So your description of the EU procurement process, as you've given it to me, is, is, is understood, but what is the problem with it? Because you said earlier on there are problems with the EU procurement No, process. sorry, it's not, it's not probably problems with the EU procurement. It's just simply whether we will get people who will be prepared to work with us in this country. I see. And um, that's the challenge. Uh, I'm more confident from our pre-tender market engagement before Christmas that we will secure people that will, will work with us. And okay. we've done a lot of work, I suppose, to try and ensure that we do get providers that will, will work with us and help yeah. us to deliver HPV. Okay, and screen. I understand it's not going to happen overnight, but I do welcome, very much welcome that we are now having it stated here today that the government has a policy of repatriating the service in the longer term and that that's clear from what's been said by um, the department here today. Um, I want to return to the uh, laboratories in the US and the, the outsourcing. I've been asking questions since this time last year, repeatedly asking the question and repeatedly, repeatedly being told that I would get the answer and I still haven't. And my simple question was, from which labs did the 221 failed uh, tests come? Where, where were they tested? And uh, could we have a breakdown? And repeatedly I was told by um, Ms Anne O'Connor's predecessor and then by several different ministers that that information would be available and I have, I could, you know, take down a rainforest with the amount of paperwork I have and questions that I answered. And at this stage, the latest information I'm given is that following, uh, and I, I'll quote the question, following significant efforts on part of the HSE, a person with appropriate expertise was identified in late 2018 to carry out this analysis and the work is ongoing. The HSE is advised that it expects this work to be completed within the coming weeks. Now, earlier on you said that any of the 220 women, 21 women who wanted access to the information on their slides could get it. That's right, yeah. So, the information about that slide, the first bit of information you see on the record is where did that slide go? And it'll say the name of the lab and it'll say the address of the lab. Why is this so long in getting this information and what is this analysis? And can you just address for me, is that analysis the same as the work that I was told last year and again this year is being carried out by the Royal College of Obstetricians, Obstetricians and Gynaecology? So firstly, apologies to the Deputy in terms of the delay. Um, two factors. One is we, we um, so sorry, it is separate to the RCOG completely, the Royal College. This was just the Deputy was seeking a, an analysis of the 221, the laboratories, and of where, the, where those slides were, where they came from, and, and how that might have transpired. 
I secured someone from Northern Ireland who agreed to do this work, but she had a reliance on someone within the programme. And unfortunately, um, the, a number of other issues meant that that link couldn't happen. They actually weren't able to meet because we had a, a gap in terms of our laboratory skill set in terms of resources that we had. So we've, the recent problem with the HPV expiration required that the, the resource we had was assigned to that, and hence they weren't able to close it out. So I had made contact with um, the, the uh, team yesterday to see what and when we could finish it. The analysis deputy is simply taking the numbers and looking at their factors like which laboratories with the programme for longer periods. Anyone who was there at the start, for example, will have a higher prevalence of cervical cancer than others that joined the programme later. So it's simply doing a proper analysis that will inform the information rather than just throwing out raw numbers that could be interpreted in all sorts of different ways, is putting actual skill set on it. And we did secure, as I say, someone from Northern Ireland who has agreed to do that work for us. So I'd be hopeful we can get that to the deputy now that we were out of the particular piece of work around the HPV expiration. And just apologise again for the delay in getting that to you. But that analysis is important, so the context for the, the figures is understood and is wrapped around it, and they're not thrown out in, in without really providing any proper information to yourself or to others around it. With respect, Mr McCallum, I've asked a simple question, which is from which labs the 20, yeah. 221 tests were tested. I didn't want a breakdown of the clinical analysis of it, just where, and I know because I've seen the paperwork, that when you pick up uh, a piece of paper to see where your, your test went, the name of the lab and the address of it is on the front page, and that's what the information I want. How that's interpreted afterwards is a piece of work you could have done for me later. So I, am, I, am I going to get it? Is this work going to, so, going to yes, be Yes, it, it is going ahead, and she spoke to me yesterday, and she's now working with the lady in the programme on the laboratory side, and we will get back to you as quickly as possible. Within a matter of weeks, I would suspect that we'll get it through. Maybe if I confirm a date with you separately, directly, if that's well, it agreeable. Well, at least a year later than from when I've asked it. But in any case, I think I'll just finish by saying that the reason I've asked it, in case anyone's in any doubt, is because I believe, sincerely believe, uh, and probably at this stage I'm convinced that it'll point to the fact that the outsourcing of this service is what's brought us to where we are. We outsourced it to labs with lower standards, uh, for profit um, research and medicine and, and, and cl clinical activity, not for public health, and this has brought us to where we are, and that's what the grave political mistake was, and I think we should learn from that and not ever, ever again make that mistake, and unfortunately we seem to outsource an awful lot of our health. Thank you, Deputy Smith. Um, I know Deputy Donnelly has a, has a question and he's under pressure for time. So, Sure, thanks. Um, I, I'd just like to go back, if I could, to the, where the, the choke points in the process are and what we can do about it. So, as I understand it, and it won't be a, a perfect understanding at all, but there's essentially four steps. There's the GPs and their capacity to meet women to have a consultation to do the smear tests. There is then cytology, which is, is a combination of looking at the cells on a screen and then potentially the HPV test afterwards if abnormalities have been detected. From there, my understanding is if it's clear, there's essentially a clear test sent back to the GP and the woman will, will meet her GP or maybe the results are sent back directly to the woman. And if it's not clear, then colposcopy is involved. So the woman will then go and see um, a consultant gynaecologist, specialist in colposcopy, who pr will do their own examination and take a biopsy. That biopsy will then go to a histopathologist, who is a consultant doctor, and then a, a, a multidisciplinary team will, will take it on from there. I'm sure there's a lot more complexity, but just in terms of the, the clinical specialties needed and the capacity needed, it's GPs, it's cytology labs, it's colposcopists, histopathologists, and I'm sure there's uh, an awful lot of specialty and complexity around that. Can I just ask, um, we, we know there are issues with GPs, with general practice in terms of capacity, but could you, could you just identify for us where the choke points are? Is it, it's going back to the six month delay, is it that women uh, can't get to see the GPs quickly enough? Is it that the cytology labs are just are holding them there and can't put them through quickly enough? Is it that uh, when the abnormalities are detected and, it, and there's a referral to a colposcopist that actually, Dr. McKenna, as, as you referenced, I know not in reference to cervical 
uh, cancer, but that there is this 28 to 30,000 people waiting for a gynae outpatient appointment. So is part of this six-month backlog uh, that the choke point has been, that the colposcopist waiting lists are now uh, uh, growing and growing, is part of the backlog that actually we don't have enough histopathologists and that the biopsies are waiting for treatment. Could you just give us a, a quick overview as to where the pinch points in this process are? So the various points are correct. But Thank God. Uh, yes, no, absolutely. But the, the reason there are uh, 80,000 smears waiting to be read has nothing to do with primary care. It has nothing to do with colposcopy clinics. It has got to do with the lack of capacity in the laboratories to look and analyse and give a result on the cervical smears. Thank you. So if we, f if we fix that, if we were to find a company in... Dublin or Cork or Kerry or London or Edinburgh who said, look, we, can, we, we do a million tests a year, we can, we can quite handily take on, you know, 10,000 10, a week for Ireland. Would that essentially fix the problem? It would be a great help. Um, currently, we are looking at the capacity of the colposcopy clinics to cope with the increased, the expected increased numbers of referrals from uh, when the change comes to HPV. Uh, so we're looking at all the, there's 15 colposcopy clinics, we're looking at those, we've visited six of them so far, and the story that we're hearing is, is pretty much the same, uh, in that there's a small lack of physical capacity um, and also uh, staffing issues. So we're doing a business plan as to how these can best be addressed, but at the moment that is not really the main problem. The main problem is looking at the 80,000 smears that are in a lab, and when those results come through, there will then be an increased referral to colposcopy, and that then will begin to be a pinch point. I, right. Thank you for that, Dr. McKenna. So just on this, and this is the final question, thank you, Chair, is let's say we could get these 80,000 mm -hmm. uh, um, tests done very quickly, which obviously we all, we all want to happen. Um, I've spoken to colposcopists and histopathologists around the country. And what they're saying is, there is a, that they have, particularly for colposcopy, that they have enormous waiting lists. And it comes to the point you made, Do uh, Dr. McKenna, around tens of thousands of women waiting for 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 gynae yeah. outpatient. If we do get, if the pinch point is currently 80,000 samples waiting to be tested, and those do begin to flow through yeah. in the next few weeks and months, which please God they will, will we then? Are, are we then essentially in another? quandary, which is we don't have enough colposcopy and histopathology well, resources. The main problem it, that we're hearing from the colposcopy clinics that were visited and from colposcopists all around the country is that there are an increased number of inappropriate referrals to colposcopy. They're not inappropriate referrals, but they're inappropriate referrals to colposcopy. From the labs? No, from, GPs. No, from primary care. Okay. Yes. So, whereas this time last year, a clinic may have seen uh, 10 or so patients a month with an abnormal looking cervix or abnormal bleeding, they may now be seeing 60 or 70. And this is clogging up the colposcopy clinic. These are the patients who more appropriately should be seen at a rapid access gynae clinic. And is that lack of, is, that, is there just more professional training needed for GPs? Is that the issue there? Um, the well, referrals? that may be a small factor, but I think uh, a more important one is, is lack of capacity. In, I mean, virtually every gynae clinic in the country is getting more referrals than they have capacity to see the patients, and consequently the waiting lists are uh, not improving. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Deputy Donnelly. And I have uh, Deputy Kelly and uh, Senator Burke indicating, and I also have some follow-up <coughs> questions myself. So I, I'm going to... Oh, my apologies, my apologies, know, Deputy Durkin and Deputy O'Connell. I shall add memory, to my memory. list forthwith. Um, on, the, on RT8 the weekend, the former Director General of the HSE said that the commitment to roll out free smears has had consequences the Minister didn't foresee. With the benefit of more rounded advice, Minister, it might have come to a different decision. I wasn't aware, that is the DG, was not aware that that particular decision was going to be made or wasn't aware it was going to be announced. I suggested to the Minister and officials that the decision should be walked back as quickly as possible. So my questions arise from that. Um, firstly, would it be your view now, looking back on it, that perhaps 
this person should have been involved in uh, the consultative or the thinking process that went up to this announcement being made. Um, and secondly, as to the advice that was given from a, a very senior person that it should be walked back as quickly as possible, perhaps you might give us a, an indicative timeline of when that conversation happened, when that advice was given and what processes were in place to start that walk back or was it a case that that advice was noted, I'm not going to say ignored, but noted and not acted on? Um, or, I, I mean, I am very curious that a decision like that wouldn't have been discussed um, at that very senior level. And I fully appreciate the, uh, the pressure uh, that, that was on people at that time, but the pressure was on because of an emerging scandal. The pressure was on because the confidence that women are entitled to have in this service had been rocked. And the solution to that, it, it, it seems to me, um, possibly should have warranted discussion from the, the most senior person, the most senior person in the HSE. So perhaps you could. So I can only tell you what happened, uh, which is that the minister made the decision based on advice, and he had clinical input, very senior clinical input, into making that decision, um, and that, that he didn't have advice to the contrary when he made the decision. He communicated that decision, and the HSC worked with the department to put the systems in place to allow that to happen, including the payments to flow to the smear takers and so on. Was that before or after? So the announcement was made? I, I think, think we moved rapidly into implementing that. So it was because, after? Because so the announcement was women made were going to present at yeah. GPs almost immediately. Mm -hmm. so, so it was underway. Um, the question then of a walk back. Um, so the, the decision was made with, with a view to it being reviewed further. Um, okay, can you give me some dates on that, I Mr. President? I can't, Bresen? no, I can't. No, okay, so we know the announcement was made on the 28th of April. Yeah. Okay, and then, but we, we don't know what discussions were held in advance of that, other than that you're, you're saying. No, I've told you very clearly people. what the discussions were okay. in advance of that, and it's, it's very clear that there is a misunderstanding on that issue, which I want to clarify, which is that the Minister made his decision based on the advice of officials, including the Chief Medical Officer, okay. and that there was no contrary advice provided to him before he made that decision. So I'm very clear before he made the decision what his advice okay. was. But he wouldn't have sought advice from the Director General? He didn't. He didn't. He, he didn't okay. uh, seek advice. He didn't have advice offered to him. He made the decision based on the advice, including the chief medical officer, and then we worked with the HSE to implement that decision. The, uh, and the, I, I note what the former DG has said, and indeed the records exist that some people who welcomed the decision subsequently asked him to review the decision. Mm. So th this did, uh, in subsequent periods, lead to people raising issues about the decision. The decision had been made with a review date. The Dr Scally's report, which was due, I think, in June, uh, was delivered in September, and that made clear that some of the issues that had been raised about the programme and about the laboratories weren't properly grounded. And in that situation, the Minister made the decision to bring an end to the retest programme. He informed the HSC of it, and then the HSC wrote back to him saying, we will bring it to an end, but let's do the tests that are scheduled okay. to December. And, and what was it that wasn't properly grounded, the decision about the labs? No. So, so we had massive public anxiety, we had a whole questioning of the veracity of the programme uh, and, and the anxiety around that which in the light of the Scali report moved the situation on into a whole series of very serious issues but not the, uh, some of the issues that ha were being debated and were out in public in the teeth of this and it netted down the issues to the ones that were working in the implementation plan on. And in that situation where he was reassured on the quality assurance within the current labs, uh, the minister then wrote to the HSE to say he was going to bring an end to the, to the retesting. And he was reassured on the quality assurance within the labs the by Scali the report. Scali report? <coughs> Absolutely, yes. Okay, so just with regard to that, um, the, and there are six, am I right, Mr. McKay, you said you visited six, or not you personally, but six of the 15 labs have been visited, is that right? The colposcopy the clinics. The clinics, yes, clinics. Yes. Okay, so with regard to the labs in the States that are used for the analysis, 
has anyone from the HSE, is, is there a programme whereby people would, would visit uh, these laboratories? Because, and I'll tell you why I'm asking that, there was a concern that tests that were outsourced were then being re-outsourced and possibly re-outsourced again. And, and my concern would be that these, and I say this as somebody who uses the service and somebody who wants, and I ask my questions because I want women to have confidence in that service, I think it's really important. I absolutely know it saves lives. I 100% back the service, but I think women deserve to have the confidence in it. So for where the tests were being sent, is it correct to say that somebody representing the people who were contracting for this service, so somebody from either the HSE or the Department of Health, has set foot inside those labs? All of them, some of them, none of them, it's not necessary, it's done by... How is that done? Because I know how quality assurance, having worked previously in an industry where they were big on quality assurance and we would have had visits to our place of work from, you know, uh, an, an army of people with clipboards and, and forms to be filled out. So, you know, and obviously these, these were people who were, were contracting out the company, so they wanted to be sure that the money that they were spending um, was being done in the best way possible. So do people physically set foot into the labs? And if so, do the same people or different people, or what's the system for when the lab contracts out and then maybe recontracts out the, the services? Yeah, I'll take that. Just a couple of points, Deputy. Just in relation to the historical context, that's one of the things Dr Scally is looking at, so his report will identify where that happened. In terms of the quality assurance, there's a range of pieces that make up the quality assurance around laboratories. Um, it did include site visits. Um, they were of a frequency of three to four years. Um, with the appointment of a new pathology quality assurance lead, we will move to annual reviews. That's one of the priorities that he's been asked to take on, is to look at ensuring that we do that. That will be one part of the overall quality assurance piece, so part of it includes the monitoring of the figures in terms of what are called um, PPVs, NPVs, various I, indicators in relation to the laboratories. Does that involve someone being physically present in these? So it did, yes. So historically there were a number of QA visits done to laboratories. They were every three to four years. It's clear, I think, from Dr Scanley's report that we need to strengthen that, and with that new appointment, one of the priorities for that role will be to build a team that will actually be able to go and visit the laboratories on an annual basis. All of the laboratories will have their own accreditation, similar, I suspect, to, to what you described in terms of the accrediting body mm -hmm. visiting them around that, but this will be for the programme over and above that. Historically, it was every three to four years, and we'll move that to an annual review of each of the laboratories and that's one of the priorities for but Dave coming in. Surely if we're going to be moving to repatriate then perhaps the, the and I understand the need for the dual I, focus yeah. but and, and just to go back to my earlier question do, this involves people being physically present every three to four years that's right a team but would visit. you be able to say with with confidence that every lab where Irish uh, women's smear tests were tested or samples taken in Ireland were tested that we had had somebody physically present. So I think you, you referred earlier to, to the issue where Dr Scally identified a number of laboratories that mm -hmm. were used without the prior knowledge of the programme, so clearly the visits would not have included those laboratories at the time, as, as I understand it. Dr Scally would report on that separately. The visits to the other laboratories every three to four years would have happened physically boots on the ground against a quality assurance standard, probably not dissimilar to, to what you've described in terms of a, a set of metrics and a set of things that you go through. Clearly, again, Dr Scally's report identified that need to be strengthened. Uh, one of those recommendations has already been implemented with the appointment of a pathology QA lead, and we have already said that we will move to annual visits. Irrespective of whether the lab is in Ireland or in mm. England or France or America, we should still be doing that on a regular basis, and that would be one part of an overall quality assurance system, which would include monitoring of sort of key metrics that gives an indication of the quality of the work of the labs, net positive value. You know, there's a range of mm. indicators yeah. specific to the programme around that. Okay, but as we sit here, so there, there still could be tests going to labs where we, where there hasn't been any form of physical inspection or anybody present to oversee the. Uh, no, so we, we have, as I say, we immediately when we became aware of it with Dr. Scally, we had conference calls with the laboratories to get that assurance that the laboratories they're using and where laboratories, for example, because we're also seeking additional laboratories for capacity, mm -hmm. and we have had one additional laboratory uh, request, and we then go through a process to actually approve that in terms of its accreditation and, and so on. 
Okay, well, I have to say the company I worked for would have been absolutely delighted if the people doing the, the quality assurance would have accepted a conference call, but they didn't. It was an on-site visit. Um, and just one final question. There's €5 million Euros allocated for the National uh, Cervical Check Laboratory. Is this going to be impacted by the cost overrun of the National Children's Hospital? Excellent news. Excellent news. Uh, now, Deputy Kelly. No, by now, nothing is going to be impacted by it, Chair. <laughs> but, but everything might be reprofiled, but that's the not an impact. Still budget. Yes. Sorry, Deputy Still, still 400, still 400, half, four half empty. 450 million in cash, Senator. Okay. Um, if, uh, yeah, and it's the following year is the problem. Um, sorry, side issue. Um, given, um, I want to get back to. The report that Dr. Scully is about to bring out, I presume that he is looking at, in this report, not just the labs and the extra outsourcing, but he's also looking at quality assurance. Is that part of his remit? Yes. Are you certain? That was part of his, uh, I probably have the terms of reference, I don't have them here directly, but um, so he was. Uh, providing a supplementary report into certain further aspects of the laboratories, such as procurement, quality and accreditation arrangements, and governance standards. Okay. And That's the terms great. of reference were published in October. Good, because we've had a huge amount of questions here in relation to quality assurance. So I expect them all to be answered this week or whenever they come out. Because we have all, and I, mean, I don't mean that in jest, we've all so many questions here. There is such a lack of traceability. There's, firstly, we don't know where it's been outsourced to. It's gathering all the time, and as a consequence, we're not assured as regards quality assurance historically or currently. Well, historically, uh, I, I think, as uh, Mr. McCallion has said, there's a clarity. Well, no, it's been improvements, but he'll be effectively coming up to the, to the current date. Yes, but, but the labs that are currently being used are those that the contract is with and those that are accredited. If in the past labs were used outside of that, Dr. Scally will look at the accreditation of those labs, the circumstances they were used, what period of time related yeah. to what factors. And what quality assurance was going on. Yeah, and, and like, because we're awaiting on it, um, uh, people can speculate. Uh, but um, what we would like to see is that that's tight. Uh, that the labs are all accredited, that they form part of a proper governance structure and so on. Um, so it shouldn't have happened, but the, Dr Scally's report will be important in, in providing I, I just want to make sure that from a quality assurance point of view, everything historically now has been looked at. Yeah. Because we need to get to the bottom of all of this. And like obviously in his, his first report he said quality assurance was non-existent. So he'll be finding out. We'll be getting into the detail of that. But he but didn't. He didn't say that. And we distinguished earlier between what uh, cervical check had he in place. He, effe he effectively said. And what the labs had in place, because when he visited the labs, he did see quality assurance systems in place in those labs, and he no, was able. He effectively to, said, from an oversight point of view. Yes, but he was able to comment on what the labs themselves had and report on that in well, his accept, report. But that's not what I said. To be fair, now I said. Well, that, so but, sorry, I'm not. I'm not trying to have a row with you, but quality assurance embraces both the program's quality assurance and the lab's quality assurance. Yeah, he was talking about the program. Yeah, and I'm just distinguishing that if he criticised the program, that is not saying that there's no quality assurance. No, I've never said that. I never said that. What I'm saying is that from a management of a contract point of view, from the management of, of the labs, and then the fact that they were outsourcing as well, that whole process and oversight wasn't there. And that's why he said previously, and what he's going to do in this report is both sides of that equation, the oversight and obviously ensure that within the labs they are doing exactly. the job too. Exactly. So I look forward to that because that's a real issue and we have so many questions there. Okay, um, as part of this process, given the fact that I have a PQ that was answered by um, Minister Harris there, when was it this week or next week, where he, he talked about um, that there would be, that Dr Scully was, that they were finding more outsourcing of labs uh, to other labs. Um, are the Department of Health or the HSE in any way reviewing the contracts with the labs? I know about what happened a few months ago as regards extending coverage and all of that, and I know all of the issues, but has there been any review of contracts as a consequence of what he's finding? Deputy, in relation to the learning from, there were a couple of recommendations in Dr Scanley's report in relation to procurement and the balance of, of contracts and so on, and emphasis in criteria. Um, we will be building those into the HPV procurement process. 
Um, in I suppose the contracts that we extended were clearly for the purpose of just trying to sustain the programme for I a period of time, that. so that's, that's slightly separate in terms of what's there. But in relation to the learning identified by Dr Scally from the procurement side, um, those would be built into the HPV so contract process. So has been made of the contracts based on what Scally is now finding at the moment? Um, well, I suppose that's a slightly different question in, in the sense of it's, it's historical. The current contracts are really geared just to bridge us through to HPV. It was yeah. about trying to sustain it. Um, the observations, Dr Scally, or recommendations that he made on the procurement side, those have been implemented as part of the, the Scally recommendations. And I suppose where we'll see them in this context is in the HPV tender. That's where they'll come through. Uh, I think uh, you'll have to look at the month's report comes out. Um, HPV, just, I know you answered this earlier on, but when are we going to have it? Are we going to have it this year? So, so the key part of that, as I mentioned earlier, is, is around the tender. So um, we're, well, two things. One is to stabilise the programme, which we've discussed here in terms of how important that is and, and the challenge to, to do that. But secondly, then, is to, we are well advanced now with the tender. We've had the pre-tender market engagement. Um, I suppose we're more confident from that that we will actually get someone, because there was obviously a risk that we might not get a partner to work with us in terms of the programme, given where, where we're at. Um, we now move to the next phase of that, which is uh, where we will have a um, advertisement place in the next couple of weeks, and I suppose that will dictate the time frame. We are trying to move all the other work streams along that I mentioned earlier, are the education materials. This year? We, we're dependent on that tender, I suppose. We're trying to get there as quickly as we can, because I think that's what everyone's interested in doing. We all want to get to that point as quickly as we can. Um, until we get into that tender process, Deputy, it's speculation. I just, I'm loath to get into that well, until I we get... To, I just, I mean, just, we keep being asked. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, and, and as I say, we are absolutely committed. We're trying to move the other work streams, the IT, as, the materials, okay. and so on. Along. Fairness, I'm not going to, because I don't want to create a, a vacuum. As regards vaccination, as regards herd immunity, you know I'm a huge advocate and have kind of passed through the doll here, the Raptors, in relation to boys. Well, what, where, where are we at as regards herd immunity and getting boys and girls HPV vaccination? I'd ask Dr McKenna or Dr Doherty to answer that. I think there is a decision has been made to vaccinate boys, yeah. and I'm, I'm not sure when that's starting, but I... Um, yeah, well, the date we've been told previously was in the fourth quarter of this year. Yeah, I but I mean, there, there, there's no doubt that vaccinating um, boys... I just want to know when it's starting, that's really... It's definitely happening in September. There's no delay, that's all I want to know. Yeah, yeah. on the school run. Yeah. Oh, fine. Just want to make sure... I just want to make, just want to make sure it wasn't... Um, it wasn't put back. Um, last three questions. Firstly, um, I'm just intrigued, and I just did a bit of research there. When did, when did it go f to 27 weeks delay for the slides? That's just the figures from this week, Deputy. We would have updated them in the last sort of 48 hours from Monday. So we have, we have a weekly process where we review it uh, in terms of the time frame. Now, you can get some spikes, so if you get an increase in the throughput in a particular week, it isn't an even distribution in terms of both the capacity. It's a big spike, because last week, according to PQ answered by Minister, is 20, on the 5th of the 2nd, it was 22. Yeah. And, and he was right to figure. say it was come down from 24, so we thought yeah. it was going to go from 24 to 22. And I'm looking at the trends rather than yeah. having a go at the fact that there's a spike. Yeah. I thought it was going from 24 to 22 and it was going to keep going down, but now it's gone up to 27 yeah. from 22. So, so just you, you do get spikes, and obviously through the Christmas period and into the New Year, so some of it, for example, in the run into Christmas, people typically, women won't typically look to get a smear result, so those figures drop off. They, they, there's also seasonal variation, so it isn't, it isn't ever an even distribution of both the demand and the capacity, but I suppose my key point really is until we get additional capacity, uh, you know, we are going to face still significant challenges in terms of the time frames, whether it's 22 weeks, 24 weeks, we have to find that capacity, that's but our priority. Is it going to keep increasing? Um, well, there certainly is, is a risk in terms of the imbalance in it, that's, that's a risk factor, but what we're trying to do is get capacity through either existing providers, other providers, and follow every leads we can, including public system, uh, and we're working even in, with other European countries to try and see what we can identify in that. I uh, appreciate it's an international thing. Um, final question, and it's a question I've asked previously, but it's just I haven't got to the bottom of it. In all of this, the audit actually stopped on the 1st of January 2018. It stopped. So we all know about the issues that were part of the audit and all of that. So if you look at it, all the other variables have stayed the same. The labs, um, Every other circumstance variable has stayed the same. So the audit has stopped, and I, 
appreciate what you said earlier on about the process by which you're going into new auditing procedures and processes and all of that across the whole screening program. Got all of that. Welcome all of that. Well, we now had a risk here because if all the variables stay the same and auditing has stopped, is it not creating a situation whereby, like the same issues that were there, that we're talking about here today and have been talking about for the last nine to, tw nine to ten months? are actually, percent, from a percentage point of view, also going to be there from the January the 1st, 2018 until now? Or is that inaccurate? And if it is, show me the variable that has changed to make it inaccurate. So, like the fact that the audit stopped on that date, all the variables stayed the same, is there not obviously going to be the same amount of issues, same issues lower percentage, obviously, because of the lower time frame, uh, because of that. Like the audit is not part of the treatment pathway. I know that. So the fact that um, there is no audit is not affecting the treatment pathway. I understand that. The fact that there is no audit, though, it's not a double check, like it's not picking up. Well, so the design of the audit is, was designed for quality improvement. Of course. So it's good, it's good to do an audit. Where, where the audit fell down was in the non-disclosure aspect. So, so that's, the, uh, that's the issue that we have to get right when but we introduce the audit on the next occasion. Oh, no, but it's, it's bigger than that, no, in fairness. And I get the non-disclosure bit, but you're also basically not finding out basic facts about you know, the quality of the programme and issues and all that. You're not finding out. There's other, very, other issues. It's not just about communications. And non-disclosure, but, but restarting it robustly is the answer to that. So redesigning the audit, taking the weaknesses that were identified out of it, and putting it back in place. That's at, at that point will be best in class because we were already ahead of a lot of other countries. We, we when we next do it, we're not going to be ahead of them in terms of timing. We're going to be ahead of them in terms of the quality system that we use. That's the best way to address the issue that that you're. It should be a continuous audit. But we risk, we risk repeating issues if we don't redesign it. Oh, I accept that. I accept that. I have no issue with that, 100% with you and getting it right. But because there's actually no audit in place at the moment since the 1st of January, does that create any risks is basically the bottom question. We, we would agree that audit is an essential part of this, um, but the difficulty is what type of audit to do, and that is what we're exploring. It has been acknowledged that the, um, the audit that has brought us all here together had flaws. Absolutely. So that certainly can't be recommenced. So what one do you recommence? How do you, um, how do you review the slides? Should they be blinded? Should they go to a, somebody who knows the result already? These are the questions that need to be explored. Um, so I wouldn't dispute for a minute that audit is an essential part of this. What we're trying to arrive at a place is what is the best form of audit to do. And there is a degree of urgency in, in starting that. I'm going to just add to that. Really as well. uh, you finish I'm finished. Finish. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry. Just an interval cancer audit, and you're right, is, is a very important part of the overall quality assurance around the programme. But there are other elements as well that we need to focus on while that expert group is working. And I mentioned earlier the appointment of the laboratory QA lead and strengthening that. But there are other indicators that are monitored by the quality assurance within the programme in relation to colposcopy, laboratory, even things like in, in GP practice and so on as well. So those elements, you're right, need to be strengthened. It was in Dr. Scally, and, and that's what we're trying to do to strengthen those. But interval cancer is just audit is just one part of that overall circle of quality. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm obligated to offer a break if anyone feels the, the need. One minute, uh, but you don't have to suspend. Uh, I could just go out and come back in. Yeah, that's, that's quite sure. We're absolutely allowed to do that. <laughs> come back in, that could be more serious. <laughs> Well, well, we'll press on if that's, if that's agreed. Yeah. Okay. So, Senator Burke. Yeah, my question is in relation to the labs and, you know, the adverse coverage that occurred here and the discussion that was in, that's in the public domain on this matter um, and also the legal issues that have occurred. In now dealing with the labs, um, are we having, um, what kind of relationship do we have in relation to uh, you know, engaging with them, 
and in getting the work done. And the other issue that I want to raise is that are there alternative labs available if um, for any reason one of these labs decides that they don't want to take on any new work and where are we with that? Like, Is there, is there a plan B there should a, a lab decide to opt out of taking any new work? Uh, and you know, we're, we're, you've already outlined the fact that we don't have capacity in this country to deal with it. Uh, and uh, how would we then deal with uh, that situation if one of the labs decided to opt out at this stage? So I suppose just in terms of relationship, clearly it was very challenging to get the contracts through in terms of maintaining the programme back through October, and, and we're still concluding some aspects of that. Um, in terms of alternative laboratories, I suppose as part of um, searching out capacity to look for, for the backlog, Senator, that is where we're trying <coughs> to find those sort of labs that would either give us capacity to address the backlog or give us contingency in the event of any other scenario arising. Um, but I won't say that that has proved easy. It is very difficult to attract that capacity because, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there is a, as people move to HPV screening, we're finding very limited cytology capacity available. Now, we are trying to constantly follow leads and uh, looking at that to try and secure additional capacity, but that same capacity would be available to address the backlog or in the event, I guess, in, in a worse scenario. But certainly we are not uh, awash with options and we are having to work very hard to try and find additional capacity primarily to deal with the backlog. And I know in dealing with some of these issues, it has clearly been established that there was uh, negligence in the way slides were read, uh, but I know the labs will also put forward the view that they're within the international norm in relation to, um, you know, that there, there isn't a 100% um, capacity to to get every, um, you know, um, screening correct. Uh, uh, is that now raising a problem in relation to where the labs are now looking for um, the department to give further undertakings in relation to this matter? Or are we still able to deal with the issue uh, in the same way as we were able to deal with it two years ago? I, I think in, in relation to the uh, environment, which is sort of what you're referring to in terms of the um, laboratories, it is certainly much more challenging. You know, that's. I, I suppose speaks for itself in terms of um, what's happened. We are trying to work with the labs in a sort of a secure way. We look at the numbers, the indicators for the laboratories from a public health perspective, which are reviewed, are within the norms. Matters of negligence are, as you know, a matter for court in terms of in yep. individual cases, so we can comment on that. Um, so we are still working with them. They are working with us to try and provide capacity. And I suppose they're, they're one of our solutions to the current problem that we face in terms of the delays that women are experiencing for slides, for their, their results to come back to them. Yeah. So we, they are working with us and continuing to work with us, and that's important for us, notwithstanding all of the difficulties, uh, in order to make sure we maintain a screening programme. Okay. But with the difficulties that we've gone through over the last six, eight months, I mean, what is the level of risk of one of those um, labs now withdrawing service? Well, I, I think there's always a risk, but in reality, we have secured contracts. We have secured heads of agreement. We're finalising contracts with with the second laboratory. They have, you know, we have worked with them to get a solution to in order to maintain the program. And um, we've heard the figures Jim referred to at the, at the start in terms of the improvements in cervical cancer survival rates in Ireland. There's lots of other figures in relation to the number of abnormalities that the program picks up. So, um, you know, I think we have worked constructively as best we can in the circumstances to make sure we maintain a program, and we're continuing to do that at the moment. Our challenge at the moment actually is less in relation to, and there is always a risk, as you say, Deputy, but is more to secure additional capacity over and above what we have from whatever means we can find in order to address this backlog, which is really our, our main concern for people. I'm sorry, no, for folks, I just... Yeah. I can say this because uh, I've observed it. The HSE has worked tirelessly to keep the labs and the programme going. Um, it wasn't guaranteed, given how, how uh, the controversy uh, was raging in Ireland. Um, and, and in a distinct way to other countries, uh, these are not laboratories who, which are public laboratories and they're not uh, uh, as embedded in our system as, as a public uh, facility would be. So they have options elsewhere and the HSE worked tirelessly to keep that capacity within the programme. It, it is more assured now than it was in earlier months. 
um, and uh, Damien has talked about the contractual situation. And the fact that we're moving to HPV, I think, is also helpful in that regard. But it's because of all of the work that Mr. McCallion and his colleagues have done that allows us to be uh, more stable in this situation than perhaps we were at the peak of the controversy. But if one of the labs just decided in the morning, I mean, we would then have a major challenge. We would, and, and I guess, look, that's something we've tried to manage through the contracts, as, as Jim has said, uh, and we're trying to mitigate further in relation to the looking at alternative capacity, primarily to address the backlog, and obviously trying to accelerate the HPV project so that we can actually get to that point through the tender as well. So, look, there is a risk, Deputy, there's always a risk, but we're trying to mitigate it as best we can and monitor it and work with the laboratories, address the issues that, that you know, members have raised here as well in parallel with that. So, you know, there's, and again, we try to strengthen the resource in the programme, the appointment of a, a senior person at, at the Laboratory Quality Assurance Lead for the programme, and bring in more resource and expertise as well, just to help do that, because clearly there's a lot of things happening around that, that whole laboratory space. Thank you. Thanks very much, Senator Burke. Deputy Durkin. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson. Can I just uh, uh, review for a moment the uh, original uh, look audit? Uh, how did that take place on the basis? Just remind me again, we went through this before uh, months ago, but just if, if, if it might be um, refreshed in my mind as to how it actually started. The circumstances in relation was it was it in relation to the number of women who who presented or were diagnosed with cancer after being cleared by the system? Was that the the, the, the first no, thing? It, the the program the, the screening program was notified about patients um, who had cervical cancer. Uh, it unfortunately did excluded the patients who were notified to the. Um, the cancer registry, so it was incomplete in that regard. Why, 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 why did it exclude those patients? Um, because there, there wasn't a cross notification uh, system in, in, in place at that time that has since been amended. And, and it was amended as a result of that of that lack of, of that facility at that point. Yeah, there, well, there weren't some there weren't some cases being re referred to the cancer register, and not all. No, the cancer registry, we, we would imagine, is complete, but the cases that were notified to the screening program were only a, about half of those that were being notified to the cancer registry. From the point of view of reassuring women uh, now, uh, how, how certain can we be that we can accurately uh, determine or how, how accurate is the system that isn't accurate as we know? In, in, in determining uh, the state of women's health, who may be passing through the system now? Well, that's that's a slightly different area. Yes. Um, uh, the 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 flaws in the previous audit um, have exposed the fact that if you if you had cancer, you wouldn't necessarily be notified to the programme. That that was a major flaw uh, that has been rectified. And has been rectified. Can, can, on, 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 a, on a positive side, if there is a positive side to, to, to this, because certainly it has been very negative from the point of view of a lot of women who have been uh, um, negatively affected and have gone through an awful lot of trauma and suffering uh, and anxiety as a result. Can I ask, and I know we got this uh, information a long time ago, but it's, 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 it's not that obvious just now, of the total number of women who were screened, uh, did the screening have a positive result for a number of women? I know they did. How many out of the total was there a positive result in, 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 in the sense that did the screening detect on time and enable the women uh, it detected to uh, receive treatment, which in turn was successful? Well, I suppose there's two, two sets of figures we could use to answer that. One is that the number of women who have been dying of cervical cancer has been falling uh, since the time the programme uh, started, and that's very satisfactory to report because that ultimately is what is the, the, the goal of the screening programme. So in that regard, it has been successful. Uh, the other thing to say is that of the two to one women who did manage to... Uh, to make it into the audit, the majority of those had very early stage disease. They had microinvasive disease, and those women are doing very well. So, 
even, even flawed and all as it may have been, the audit has provided some reassuring data that the majority of women are alive and well. Now, that, that is not in any way to minimise the impact of those that have died or indeed the impact of those that are suffering from complica complications of treatment. But the majority are alive and well due to the fact that the programme did identify them at an early stage. Uh, given that, that a certain number of women, we don't know, we know that the number of women uh, dying of cervical cancer has, has, has dropped, but do we know precisely or in any way, have we any way of measuring the number of women who were screened, whose condition was identified, pre-existing condition was identified and who subsequently were treated successfully? Yeah, we, we would have that data, Deputy, in terms of, I mean, you're into thousands of people every year, abnormalities are picked up through the programme, and I think it's one woman every two days is diagnosed with cervical cancer as a result of screening through the programme. So we would, that data is published regularly in terms of the abnormalities that are picked up through cervical screening for, for women. To just say, Deputy, since 2008, when the programme was introduced, there's 1,200 invasive cancers identified through the programme and more than 50,000 women with high-grade abnormalities have been diagnosed and treated. Um, that doesn't fully answer the question because obviously some of them would have, have gone on, many of them would, would be cancer-free now, some, some of them would have gone on um, to, to um, um, not be successful in their treatment. But you can, sheer, you can see the sheer numbers of, of what has been detected by the programme and women being identified either for follow-up or for treatment. Uh, has contributed to what Dr McKenna has identified as the mortality reduction as a country that we've got in this area. So there's no doubt that at the population level this programme has been hugely successful. That's not to take from the individual issues that have arisen, but I don't think anybody would question that the decision in 2008 to develop a national approach to cervical cancer was the correct thing to do. Again, can, can, can I just go back to the, 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 the screening again? Uh, of of the, the, and the look back, uh, how have you been able to determine uh, the number of women who were identified as having uh, a, a, a pre-existing condition that required treatment? Have we that number exactly? Can we, do, do we know how many? That would be a matter of looking and seeing how many of the colposcopy clinics have treated for pre-invasive cancer over the years. That number can be got, but it would be into the thousands, um, as Mr. President had said. Yeah, could we, could, could we maybe... Uh, yes, well, that's that's the, that number is, is published in the... A reasonable, yeah. a reasonable number as of, as of now. Yes, I mean, yeah. there, there, there are thousands of women have been treated for pre-invasive cancer that has stopped from gone on to being invasive cancer. Of the 221 women, uh, Madam Chairperson, uh, that, that uh, had um, uh, different results and ultimately some, some, some having satisfactory treatment, etc., when they were discovered, uh, did alarm bells go off anywhere? Uh, in respect of uh, the laboratories to which their uh, tests had been sent. For example, if you were at the receiving end of the report and suddenly discovered that 10, 20, 15 or whatever uh, um, uh, results showed, showed, showed uh, in, in, in negative in terms of accuracy, uh, would it be normal to reach back and find out which laboratory dealt with them? particularly if uh, a series of, of, of situations arose from one particular laboratory, would it, would it, would it, be, would it be possible to identify, uh, I know that the thing is ongoing and that it hasn't been determined just yet, but I, I think in terms of micromanagement, uh, it might be possible to find out, say, the first 50, 60 cases, where did they come from? Deputy, we, we've already committed to provide that to, to Deputy Smith, and just the only cautionary piece is that the analysis is important. Some laboratories are, who were with the programme in the earlier years would have had a higher number of women with cancer because there would have been a higher prevalence in the early years. Some laboratories also looked at younger populations in terms of where they serve. So there are factors that would 
do that, but we've committed to make that available to Deputy Smith, and we can make it available That's to the Commission. No, 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 uh, no disrespect, Madam Chair, President. That was my question. My question was a slightly different one to Deputy Smith's one, because she was seeking to ascertain the, the, the uh, laboratories from whence the inaccuracies came. I'm asking a different question. Initially, uh, when the first results began uh, to become available, and that uh, was a pattern established. In the first, in, in, instead of waiting for the, the 221 women, in the first 50 women, 40 women, 20 women, for example, if, if, if they all came from one laboratory, I would be inclined to, 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 to uh, pull the emergency brake and find out what was going wrong, if that were the case. If, on the other hand, if, on the other hand, they were scattered amongst all the labs, that might create a different situation and might lead one to the conclusion that, well, look, there's a, there's a, there's a fault in the system somewhere, and they're all making the same uh, mistake, or they're all falling into the same trap. Which would it be? Now, I, th I, think, I think it's no harm to remember this now, that it has to be possible to determine that uh, fairly readily, and that, which in turn would have said, well, OK, uh, we want to watch what's coming from that particular laboratory, or we, want to see, we, we should check to find out what they're doing. Or, if there's a particular laboratory that has no negative results at all, uh, why is that the case? So, I, I think we're back, we are back into the Scali report, which was to look at how the audit was managed and how the linkage back into the labs took place. And from the cervical check programme, we have identified recommendations to improve that, but that at the time that the, the results were coming through, they were seen to be within the expected levels for a screening program and for laboratories uh, and Scali. Um, Equally deal, across all the laboratories. Well, he deals with that, but that's not to say that the systems that were in place were as robust as they should be, and that's where the importance of his recommendations is going forward, that we would have... Um, but the same systems were in place for all the laboratories. They were. Well, the, the overall uh, cervical check systems were the same. Each laboratory then has its own systems. But the, the, uh, that would immediately lead into the, 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 the question that I'm trying to, to ask there. Because they had their own systems, it would immediately lead me to be alert to the fact that were their systems good enough? And I know this goes into the Scali re uh, yes. report as well. But in the initial stages, it should have been possible to, to, to become alarmed if there was a particular trend. A trend established, a trend had to be established long before the 221 women uh, now referred to uh, were in that particular category. So, the, the two things, one is travelling back in time, was there a trend? And, yes. and to identify whether there was a trend, you actually have to do some reasonably sophisticated analysis. It's not sufficient to say, that percentage over there and that percentage over there. You have to look at the different risk factors that the laboratories have got. And, and Dr. Scally goes through that. But importantly, where Dr. Scally positions us is going forward that the quality systems operated by the program will be such in the future that we can be all reassured that they are fully robust in identifying any issues that emerge within the context of a screening program where there will always be an element of false negatives. We, we, you won't eliminate that fully. Mm. Thank you. Deputy O'Connell. Thank you. I'm um, just following on there from Deputy Durkin. Um, so what, are, you, are you really saying that you can't look at Lab A's results and Lab B's results and compare them because there could be different patient cohorts going into the labs? So you could have most women over, I'm not sure what the age is, I think it's over 50 or 55, will automatically show um, cell abnormalities. So it depends on the batch. If you're sending in smears for 22-year-olds, thousands of them, and you're sending in to one lab, and you're sending in thousands of smears from 60-year-olds, they're not dealing with the same disease spread. Isn't that really that, what, what, what we can, why we can, yeah. I'm just trying to help you know, Mr. You President. Know, but also it's not that I'm saying it, it's Dr. Scali saying Oh, absolutely. I'm just trying to add a bit of... A more likely explanation would be if one laboratory, for example, had a disproportionate number of colposcopy clinics, yes. then they would be more likely to have a higher number of invasive disease. they've already been triaged Correct. as in having yes. more yeah. than likely so something there, wrong. So there are, there are reasons, as um, Damien has said, why different laboratories could have different expected rates of invasive cancer. <coughs> I understand, and this is getting back to what 
uh, Deputy Durkin asked, that there is no laboratory appears to have no um, uh, uh, I mean, every laboratory appears to be have had a, a number of interval cancers, yeah. and there's, there's there's no laboratory appears to stand out as having none. Mm -hmm. Now that will need to be confirmed, but in, initial inquiries would suggest that there is no particular laboratory has any very obvious issues in terms of interval cancers. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I want to ask you now. Oh yes, regarding the um, HPV, herd immunity and all that, where, it might have been asked already, we went down to 52% with the girls, where are we now percentage wise um, when it comes to HPV uptake after all of the um, catch up programmes um, and are we still on a going up, 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 up the graph as opposed to down the graph um, when it comes to uptake um, of young girls with the vaccine. I think it's very important um, that although I'm very much supportive of the boys getting it in September, we can't take our eye off the girls um, because, you know, it, 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 will, um, it won't work out, I'd imagine, if, 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 we don't, if we don't keep the pressure on there with the girls. And in terms of um, the marketing and um, the awareness around the HPV for the boys, um, I'm assuming that there's a robust team in place um, to market this to the schools so we, and to parents and to boys um, so that we don't end up in the situation that we ended up in with um, leaving, the, I suppose, the door open for people to um, attack the vaccine and have, have, a, neg have a, waste, a waste of money, essentially. And I know when I was talking to Dr. Fraser, um, who, who developed the vaccine um, from, from Australia, a few months ago, and um, I did speak to him at length about the barriers um, they came up against in terms of prejudice, in terms of you know scaremongering, in terms of the savings when it comes to I think it's a nine valent vaccine and two strains deal with um, genital warts. About almost the positives in that, in that it can be um, younger boys tend to respond very well to knowing that a particular vaccine is going to. Um, stop a visible STI. So just around the whole um, process of bringing in the boys HPV vaccine, um, are, we, are we good to go and are we, are we definitely doing it right, that we don't fall into the same, um, have the same pitfalls we've had with the girls where we'd maybe have an initial high rate and then it should pull back and we'd be back in the same situation again. Um, in terms of the the, the rapid access um, gynae clinics, Mr. McKenna, that you spoke about, and you've mentioned them a couple of times since I came in. Are, are, we, are we going to get one of those for the 20 to 30,000 people? How are we going to deal with the backlog of the, 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 the women waiting um, for symptomatic? Um, for the, for the symptoms to be looked at, people are symptomatic, and also, as, as Deputy Johnny said, perhaps the next tranches are going to come through um, as a result of the increased awareness. And we've spoken here, I think, in terms of the maternity strategy in the last few years about how many um, physical issues with women's obs and gynae tend to be put on, on the long finger, that if you're not if you're able to cope um, and get through your day, um, that you'll be fine kind of attitude. So how are we with that, um, dealing with this other end of it, as it were, the rapid access clinics? Well, I think that uh, there has got to be a, a, a serious, a more serious look at rapid, rapid access for gynae clinics. Um, I would agree that um, a, a lot of benign gynaecology has been overlooked in the, um, I suppose, in the justifiable um, uh, rush to look after malignant gynaecology, but there are very serious benign gynaecological complaints um, that are life-changing, that are not cancer, mm -hmm. and um, it, it would be true. You might, you might, Mr. McKenna, just for the committee, maybe give us a few examples. I'm thinking prolapses and things like that. What, what, what women who are, what these 20 to 30,000 people are living with? Well, I. That's I, not. I, W cancer, one one would hope that the vast majority of them were living with relatively minor issues, but there can be very serious, I say, life-changing mm. ones. And uh, the most uh, the most obvious gynaecological one would be uh, women that have got incapacitating menorrhagia, um, who would be anemic, uh, possibly due to large fibroids. 
Now, it can be difficult to get prioritised for surgery because uh, there's no doubt that benign gynaecology has been seen in the past as a soft target for cancellation when accident and emergency departments get, uh, get busy. So there needs to be a greater emphasis on, on day case surgery, uh, outpatient um, uh, investigations, and also the ability to operate on those few patients that do need full hospital care. Um, I, I, I in terms of work days loss, like in a case of somebody um, who has, just as you described, um, constant bleeding, anemic, most people in that situation like their, their work would be affected, they're, they're, they would have sick days and all of that. So there's a huge exchequer issue when you have 30,000 women. Um, well, I, I, I again would say the, the, the hope would be the vast majority of these are, are relatively minor issues that could be dealt with. Um, at I suppose a, at minor, it depends. And, no, I, I, I appreciate that, but um, one doesn't wish to overstate the case either. Um, but there, there are certainly some women who, as I say, have incapacitating issues, both of pain and bleeding, uh, that are life-altering. Hmm. Um, in terms of, you, somebody mentioned about a six-fold or five to six-fold increase in referral to colcoscopy, I think. Um, I'd imagine there's a certain amount of um, stress among GPs to make sure, and doctors, to just to make sure nothing is missed. Um, is there any, has there any work been done in terms of primary care level practitioners um, sort of to develop care pathways coming out of all of this um, so that we don't end up perhaps with a six-fold increase in perhaps unnecessary colcoscopy? Well, I saying? suppose... I'm not saying they're, they're unnecessary. Well, no, I mean, okay, I say just, they would there's be a better sixfold increase. They so. would be better directed to mm. a general gynaecological clinic if one could get access to those quickly. But yes, is the answer. Um, the, the programme has an educational component about what a, nor a normal cervix looks like, and individual colposcopy clinics are reaching out to their catchment areas to, to, to educate. Um, uh, those general practitioners that would benefit from it. But it, there's, a, there's a strategic program here. There is, is there, within or the is program, it both nationally but also locally, individual clinics who feel they have pockets of um, practice that could be improved are doing so. And just finally, Chair, just going back, uh, Mr. McCallion, to this new QA lead, the consult consultant level. Um, I'm just a little bit uncomfortable with it in the sense that we had lots of QA people already in <coughs> cervical. Do they still exist? Yes, yes or no? Just yes. do me. Yes, yes. so there's a, there's a wider quality assurance need, but there was a specific gap identified. Oh, yeah, I, I got that. Okay, so we had a QA team and none of them were consulted. What were they if they weren't? Were they doctors or were so they from industry? What were they? You would have they? a mixture of medical science. It depends on, on the program. So in some cases... Could I have a breakdown of the QA people sure. that we had before sure. and where they came from? So were they, were, they, were they doctors, were they pharmacists, were they lab people, what, what were they? And so then it's true to say that we had nobody at consultant level pathology assessing the contracts ever, so hang on, ever, to see were they the right standard. So I think there are a number of issues. The contracts, in terms, there, there are in terms of the contract management piece that would have been assessed. Dr. Scally identified areas for improvement in that, and those are, are part of the implementation. Yeah, Dr. Scally was very clear, and, and yeah, I said it earlier. Those sorry, now, Chair. Dr. Scally was very, uh, from memory, I think it was page 52 of the report, but there's a box on one of those pages, yeah, and it shows that um, the contract was for ISO accreditation. A particular lab said, don't mind your ISO, we have the American College of whoever says we're doing everything fine. So we've had contracts that have been awarded and have been operational and these labs are testing this, have been looking at smears. And I'm fine with the different discrepancies and all that. And it seems to be clear from what Mr. McKenna said, it looks from the outset as though there isn't an outlier here. I'm just trying to get down to how this could have happened. How could we not have ever had a consultant level pathology expert looking at the labs where we were sending all of the smears to to see where they up to scratch. What were the QA people doing? 
What were they QAing? So, so they would have been QAing against a quality assurance standard that was defined based on best practice, most of it taken in from the NHS. Yeah. What Dr Scally is saying, that extra level of input that's needed in terms of consultant level input was a gap in the programme. So we were taking the, the standards program. from the NHS and applying it to the contracts we were giving it to other countries, but still when this person um, was ticking off, um, when they were comparing it um, to what the standard was supposed to be, they obviously totally missed the fact that Quest Laboratories hadn't the accreditation that the contract so said I, they should I think have. That's probably a slightly different issue in terms of the equivalence, and Dr Scally is looking at this at the moment in terms of the accreditation standards, are they equivalent or not? So the tender at the time, as I understand it, went for ISO or equivalent. The discussion was, is CAP standard in the States mm -hmm. equivalent to the ISO standard? And that's something that Dr Scally is looking at from our discussions with him, and he'll be reporting but We had that. nobody We've before Dr Scally who looked at that. No, so the, the original decision on equivalence was one of the things that he highlighted in his report, how, the, how that decision was made. We would have been, the, the programme, if you like, at that point in time, would have been looking at the quality assurance standards as set out and prescribed by the programme. There's a quality assurance document. We, we would have certainly... From memory, how many quality insurance thing. people were working on Cervica? Was it six, ten, twelve? Uh, no, no, you'd have, you'd have a small team of people who would work on the QA side, probably a couple of people. Um, in terms of the QA aspect of it. So the, bear in mind the labs have to be accredited. Two, two people were working on it. Why are you? Two people were working on it, but it, was it their full-time job? <laughs> um, so the, there are, well, for one of them, yes, and for the other person, they would have a number of other roles as well historically, and that's the reason why we're trying to strengthen that up on the back of Dr Scally's recommendations. So. So, but it was, at least one person was employed full time to do this. In terms of quality assurance across the yeah. program, yes, yeah, there would have been someone in a QA role. Each of the programs has a QA lead, and they coordinate okay. and the response grade is to that. This person? The, the, uh, the, the, the whole time equivalent person, the, the one WT. Yeah, I'd have to check the grade in terms of the, the, the status, but I guess what, what I'm saying is in terms of the recommendation, the pathology gap is something Dr Scally has said the programme needed to strengthen. We've moved to secure someone and that person has started in that role, okay. and that will obviously mean going forward that we have that extra experience and senior level input to the quality assurance process in relation to the laboratories. Okay. More like a canyon rather than a gap, not to have somebody who's an expert in this. Thank Can you. I just Thank answer you. in terms of the HPV uptake? Um, just oh, yes, to say please. that the girls' uptake is at 65% and it's increasing. Uh -huh. So it's continuing to increase. And I think we're one of the few countries in the world that's seen a reversal that we've seen. In terms of the boys' programme, uh, that is outside of obviously this programme here, but it's been worked up through public health and the National Immunisation Office, and it'll be the same based on the success of the girls' programme, we'll be rolling out the same type of programme, obviously targeted at boys, but it is still a good news story in terms of the girls' HPV uptake. But in terms of... It's been far between... Uh, <laughs> it's 65% in rising definitely is good news. In terms of trying to not end up where we were. We had a great rate with the girls and we went back, yeah, no, and then we completely. came up again, yeah, no, I think we mitigating against the same yes, thing happening yeah, yeah, again. Absolutely. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Deputy O'Connell, and I'm conscious, Senator Conway, while you've been waiting very patiently. <laughs> okay, and I was watching proceedings uh, earlier uh, on, the, on the screen, and I suppose just briefly to go back to 2008, and I completely agree with you, you know, the National Cervical Screening Programme was the correct thing to do, absolutely. There's no uh, ifs or buts around that. But I think we need to separate that from the decision to outsource to the U.S., because I would say that that was deadly, dangerous and unforgivable. Uh, now, I know you may dis dispute that, but, and I really think, you know, uh, Dr. David uh, Gibbons at the time resigned over this. He felt so strongly about it, and it's not often you get resignations, and I think it's something that we need to take heed of, and, and maybe not just um, pass over because he did say, and at the time he pointed out, that there was uh, one-third fewer, um, fewer diagnoses than there, were, than there were in Ireland at the time. So, you know, it's the public servant's job to make representation, to, to give advice and, recommend, and give recommendations. But at the end of the day, a minister made that decision and a cabinet made that decision. And I think no matter how all of this unfolds and we go down the road on it, that was um, a deadly decision that, and it feeds back, I suppose, into the whole accountability and us all being accountable for the decisions uh, that we make. But there's some specific questions I want to ask you, and it's just going back to uh, the review and the audit um, for the 1800 smears. Just 
when will that audit begin and when will it finish? And do you think that the Taoiseach, why do you think the Taoiseach um, said that, promised that they would be completed last May? You know, was he misguided in doing that or what led him to believe that they would be completed in May? I don't mean to be disrespectful, Senator, mm. but I'm here as a civil servant mm. to give factual information. Yeah. You're asking me to pass judgment on both 2008 political mm. decision making and uh, uh, the Taoiseach's uh, <laughs> statements. And I, I'm happy to answer the questions mm. in, if they're posed in a different fashion, mm. but I'm not engaged in uh, either support or criticism mm. of political and, figures. That's not the role we, yeah. we seek to come here to play. Yeah, and I wouldn't committee. expect you to be, and that's probably why we, we, we need the minister in here as well. So I suppose to ask that, I mean, I need to ask you about what, you know, what information you would have given for him to be able to say that things would be, you know, are the resources in place, um, that they would be completed in May that the audit would be completed in May, because that's what he said at the time. Or has there been any changes that didn't allow them to So it's taken much longer than anybody would have expected uh, to get the uh, Royal College uh, <coughs> audit underway. Um, that wouldn't have been envisaged at the time. Um, so absolutely things developed in a way that wasn't uh, apparent at the time. Uh, it's also relevant to go back and understand the period we were in, where people were seeking to address issues as quickly as they can and to place an onus and a responsibility on all of us to do that as quickly as possible. Uh, and they were doing that for good reasons. Um, but we, we have experience now of uh, all of the processes that have had to be gone through. Um, the uh, HSE has talked to it and, and can uh, repeat it. The process is now underway. The slides are moving to the laboratory. ORCOG has commenced its, its work. Uh, they've said that they will complete that within six months. Um, so okay. we, we now have a clarity around this uh, that wasn't available at the time. Okay, so it started when? The, the slides to, to yeah, ORCOG? Yeah, for the 1800, the ones for the, the Royal College so of... So Mr McCallion can, can talk to the uh, process, including the process of agreeing yeah. how ORCOG would do this, the transfer of the data to ORCOG and the transfer of the slides. Well, just maybe I'm looking for kind of the start date and the finish date, so when we can tell uh, uh, women and families that, okay, this started on this date, it's going to be completed on this date. See, because people feel let down because they were promised that it would be done in May, you know, without going through all of the, the processes involved. It's so. just like... Mr. McCallion will have to give you the detail because women had to be written to and asked for their consent. That's right, yeah. So, so it started, but then there have been various steps along the, the way. Mm. The data has moved to ORCOG and the slides have moved in uh, the, just in, in the very recent past. So if, if Damien would walk us through that. So, so very briefly, the stages were one was to build the link with the National Cancer Registry, which was one of the gaps. That identified 1,702 women that were eligible. It was necessary to establish um, next of kin in many situations as well in That's terms right, of that yeah. side. And then we moved into a consent process of writing to everyone and, and giving people a second option. And there was a support line and a system built on all of that to, to manage all of that. We're now in the phase where the laboratories in recent weeks have started moving slides to the RCOG. And as Jim has said, their commitment then is on receipt of all those slides. They, it will take them six months then to conclude it. So the slides have started moving in the last number of weeks. We'll continue over the next few weeks in batches through to the RCOG. And there are 1,072 women that have consented to partake in, in the audit. Okay. And they will have, I haven't the exact figure here, but there will you know, be a, a no, several thousand probably slides to be moved. Each woman may have a number of slides. I don't have the exact figures. So but can it's you say that they will be all moved, say, by the 31st of March? Oh, yeah, that's, that's yeah, and, and hopefully before that. I mean, the process has started and the schedules that they're agreeing at the moment would, would say coming in certainly earlier than that. And, and they are also trying to then, from the RCOG side, they will be moving the slides to laboratories to be read <laughs> once they have a quantum there, so they're not waiting for, for everything. So can we say that by September of this year that they will be all completed, that the audit will be completed? I think that's for the RCOG in terms of the time frame, but what they're saying at the moment, look, it's six months from when they kick off. I think that's something probably we'll need to reconfirm with them, but that's their time frame around it is six months from when they start working on the slides. So. 
So who's in charge of it all? I mean, who, who's the Well, the RCOG, it's, it's an independent review. I mean, the mm. HSE's job is to facilitate and support it in terms of managing consent, mm. in terms of getting the slides, working with the laboratories, working with RCOG. Mm. There's weekly meetings with RCOG, with colleagues in the department and the HSE, and there's a separate dedicated team been set up purely just to support the RCOG within the HSE. So who's accountable? So well, the, RC the RCOG effectively run, it is an independent review commissioned you know, by, by the Minister. So are we they accountable then, are you saying the RCOG well, are the, accountable Yeah, the RCOG will produce the report, yeah, they'll produce the report for each woman and they'll produce a report on the overall uh, piece of work that they're so doing. So they're, they're accountable, so everything will be done within... You see, part of the reason I'm asking you is that I have a, a, one person here in particular, he has been campaigning for answers since last April about the death of his partner his partner of 22 years, uh, who died of cervical cancer in 2017. And he is getting no response whatsoever uh, from that. So he consented, obviously, as soon as he was asked uh, for the smear to be audited. Um, but he has no idea whatsoever. And like, how that compounds his grief in grieving for his partner and not being, you know, the minister is refusing to, you know, he doesn't answer his letters. Nobody answers him. So, Deputy, if it's helpful, maybe I'm happy to take his details maybe offline mm -hmm. with you. We have a helpline and we have a senior mm -hmm. clinician as well who has talked to people who've been affected by this because, uh, and I'm happy maybe to, to have a conversation either myself or through one of our consultants to talk to him directly. Okay, if, if you could, to because you. that's what, you know, I talk about when I talk about accountability in terms of yeah, the, sure. the communication. Because I don't think any of it is acceptable, and I really think that you know, the empty promise that was made without, and I find it surprising that somebody with a medical background, but I completely understand what you're saying in terms of being able to comment about any of that. My, my own, and we do a lot of work with the committee. My one principle here is that we don't politicise. Mm. Like there's a day when it might be nice to do it, and then mm. a day when it'd be hard, we just don't. Mr. President, no one's asking you to, no. to politicise anything. I'm just not and, going and to get drawn the, into the conversation. And we're not, we're not oh, yeah. seeking to do and, that at all. And um, I wouldn't expect you to, sorry, uh, Kerr, I wouldn't expect you to, but our job is, we're public representatives. We have, we have to do that. And if we all do our job and we're all accountable, then I think things would be for a lot easier. I want to ask you, we're starting just around the, the breakdown of the packages that have been negotiated with Quest Labs. Have their packages been negotiated in terms of what... Uh, um, what has been, what has been agreed? So compensation packages agreed with Quest Labs? We wouldn't be party. I mean, any cases that are taken through the court were worked through the State Claims Agency. Um, and yeah. we wouldn't be party to that. Like, we would have read what everyone else has read in, in, in the sense in the media, but we wouldn't directly be party to those discussions. Okay, so it's directly the State Claims Agency. Yeah, they would deal okay, with I'll those take cases. It up with, um, with any them. cases through court, yeah. Uh, why do you think there hasn't been immediate action to implement the open disclosure policy that was recommended by Dr. Scali? The recommendation was a review uh, of the open disclosure policy, so we've committed to doing our interim review by quarter two. We're still on target to do that. Uh, that isn't just about changing the language in the policy. There's actually a significant amount of consultation uh, with patients involved in that, so that process is underway. Um, and I think we're awaiting feedback on some of those elements now from patient groups. So that we are on target and that has been part of the implementation plan and the, the date has always been quarter two, 2019. So it will be done by the end of July? So the, the HSE's interim review will be done by, yeah, in quarter two. Yeah, yeah. I think again that's June. a concern to the people involved in that, that it is taking so long. Uh, that, that was the date that we have always said in terms of the time frame for that. Right. Okay. We're, getting, we're getting one date right. Thank you, uh, Senator Conway Walsh. Uh, Deputy Chambers? Uh, thanks, Chair. And sorry to, to Deputy Chambers, I'm very conscious and I appreciate you're only here, but these people have been here no, I, for the I, entire morning, no, I, so please I, be I, as I, brief as, as you I can. I acknowledge that and um, <laughs> look, I know it's been a, a long morning. I just have a few uh, specific uh, questions. Just the European guidelines for quality assurance in cervical screening. Um, I just want to know how, how do the Irish uh, guidelines on that match to those guidelines and has there been just an update on that specifically because say in terms of site or technologists um, is it they, they recommend say five minutes per slide one minute per documentation have we kind of a, an analysis present real-time analysis of where um, 
the Irish position rests with those guidelines, uh, and is there anything we need to uh, is there anything we need to address in matching the those the gold standard there? I can go ask a few questions, maybe, and then very quicker. Make more sense, yeah. Deputy. Thank uh, you. Just the other thing is uh, the gold standard um, per. So obviously we have a significant wait time, uh, 27 weeks. Um, what's the gold standard for? Uh, screening in terms of the, the wait time in which a slide is actually analysed um, and how does that slide pathologically deteriorate while it's being weighted because I think there is general concern about that and perhaps you can give certainty to it about what the pathological deterioration of a slide might be uh, if there is a significant wait time uh, for that. Obviously the third question is the um, Obviously, the minister decided. I just clarity on that. I know uh, Mr. President said that it, um, we won't be getting into politics, and we shouldn't. But was that? Can you confirm if that was a political decision or a professional decision to offer that? And on that, uh, can you? I suppose one of the concerns I'd have is, and I know at the time we can all look back in the cold heart. The minister said that last week there was a general concern about um, screening. Uh, one issue I'd have is that if you look at in the inverse care law, you have probably the least likely cohort who, uh, who may have a difficulty or an issue. Maybe, maybe the least, sorry, the a cohort who may, because of their own circumstances, may be the most likely uh, to have a difficulty. Maybe the least likely to take the free test. So just looking beyond the reassurance that strategy that, that was there. Um, has there been a look back of, say, previous smears and the risk that may have been attached to a particular person's uh, clinical characteristics and whether they need to be notified around uh, a future um, test? I don't, I, I don't know if that probably makes sense, but if someone who may not have taken up the opportunity of a free test Maybe the more maybe the more likely person to actually require that retest um, based on their own clinical background. I know that's a complex piece of work, and perhaps Dr. Scally is examining that, or maybe that there isn't a necessity to do it. But just in terms of the inverse care law, and and that's a question. Um, uh, I, I just want to know, in terms of the backlog that's there, has there been a risk profile conducted of what what's an urgent uh, what's an urgent smear and what isn't, uh, and are certain smears being prioritised over others within the um, within the wait time that's there uh, within 27 weeks? Um, and what's the uh, the uh, sorry the question here? Um, just in terms of the, this may have been asked. So I apologise at the Justice Committee all morning. Um, the HP vaccine. Um, when will that be extended out? This year, no, that question has Apologies. been asked. Yeah. If you don't yeah. mind, no, just, I, just in the interest of Greg, I don't, I don't want to ask any Thank question you. that uh, has already been answered. So thanks to Gang to Guess. I give a very quick answer on the HPV vaccine, which is September of this year, and then if I do the retest and I ask colleagues to, to do the other issues. Um, so the decision was made by the Minister based on professional advice, and we've been through that over the course of the morning. The Minister got advice, including from Chief Medical Officer. Um, we could speculate around the inverse care law. I think a couple of things to consider. One is that without the state saying they would fund a consultation, yeah. no, I appreciate that. those with the means to do so yeah. would have, and they would no, probably have been the ones that yeah. were least likely. No, um, so the fact that the state funded, in some sense, equalised things. Yeah. The other thing you have to consider is there's quite a fall off between the numbers that had the consultation with the GP and then went on to take a test. Yeah. So the very fact that they had reassurance was sufficient for them at that stage. And then ultimately, if people didn't come forward, didn't get a retest, or didn't go to their GP, the programme still has those people and will continue to call them for uptake. And so they're still within the programme. It's not that they've fallen out of the programme. They'll still yeah. be in the programme and called according to the timescale set out in the programme. In terms of the European guidelines, what, well, that would have been an input into the previous QA standards. One of the actions from Dr. Scally's recommendation is to update those QA standards in line with best practice, which would include the European guidelines, but also looking at those in, in other jurisdictions as well. 
and that's also been done from two perspectives. One is the current programme, and two is there's a separate process underway for the HPV testing, because that will need a new quality assurance model for that. In terms of the standard, the standard was 17 days prior to the crisis in terms of a turnaround of a test. Um, that was the turnaround from when the slide went to the, the laboratory received the slide to when it went back in terms of the results back to the GP or, or, or to the woman. Uh, and that's clearly, we're, we're some way from that at the moment. So that's the challenge we would have discussed here this morning in terms of how we address that uh, in terms of finding more capacity, because that's what it will need to address the backlog that's there. What we have done in terms of risk mitigation, we have prioritised the colposcopy clinics where clearly there is a need to try and um, read those smears much earlier. Uh, we're looking at how we have a solution in relation to, and it possibly addresses your point in clinical background. A woman in a programme could be on a six month, one year, three year or five year recall and that in some way reflects the risk to the woman. What we're looking at is whether a technology solution can be developed around. It's quite complex. Unfortunately, the six and one year group, the normal three and five year, you know, that, that's a lower risk in terms of, of profile. In addition to that, one of our laboratories, which had a quantum of the backlog, we were concerned we sanctioned the use of HPV testing, and that was a way of triaging. In other words, by running through HPV, it identified those smears that perhaps were a higher risk and moved those to, to cytology much earlier. So they're the sort of actions we've taken to try and mitigate the risk while still trying to find capacity to, to get us to a, to a stable point. So we've done a six-month cycle of, of, of smear testing. Could some of them be waiting six months for the outcome of that? Th th that is a risk at the moment, yes, and that's yeah. what we're trying to address in terms of yeah. putting in some sort of solution that would technically identify those in some way. Yeah, it I think that's very complex. important. I just think um, I think there should be a, a an urgent maybe profiling of those uh, that those categories because obviously they've been identified as a particular clinical risk, um, and I think lumping them all. Uh, and I know it might be difficult with whatever providers you have there, but I think that's a, you know, that provides for greater risk uh, that I think need, needs to be addressed quickly. Like, just think that that, you know. No, I, I accept that, Debbie. Then, yeah. as I say, the, high, the highest risk group is colposcopy. Those are being prioritised and those yeah. are, are being worked through. And then we're trying to work through through the others using, as I say, the, the prioritisation and then also the triage for any laboratory that, that for a laboratory that was had a significant delay is to move those through much quicker because it effectively prioritises in the same way that HPV screening will ultimately yeah. when that goes live. And can I suggest that you might provide an update for the committee uh, on that work because the, the, sure. the points made are very valid. Um, Sinead? Okay, great. Uh, so uh, I have one question, and then we're done, uh, and it's a very quick one. The advice given to the minister prior to the 28th of April from the chief medical officer was that written down? My, my recall is it was written down in the context of the press statement that went out. So they they worked they worked on that to come up with the precise announcement that would be made, i.e. Um, a consultation with a GP, and if in that situation it was merited. Okay, but in the consultation and the deliberations, yeah, in the there run is up records, to that. and we've done FOI, and, and those have been okay. released. Okay, 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 that's fine. All right. So, um, on behalf of the committee, I want to thank Mr. Breslin, Mr. Dempsey, Ms. Conroy, Ms. O'Callaghan, Ms. O'Connor, Mr. McCallion, Mr. McKenna, and Dr. Doherty for appearing here today. This has been a really useful engagement, and I, I you know, committees sometimes get a bit of a, a bad rap, but I think it's really important. But we have conducted our business, I believe, in a very respectful way, and we send a message to women that everybody here wants them to have faith in, in that service, and that's, what, uh, that's where I think our, our focus should be. So I thank you all, and uh, I know this has been uh, quite a marathon session, so I thank you for your patience and your answers. Thank you. Uh, the committee is adjourned until the 27th of February 2019. Is that agreed? 27.